The more I dive into your life, you're, you're quickly becoming the most interesting man alive. When they wouldn't talk to me, I was like, they must be hiding something. There's a story there that might be worth telling. Your lives are at stake. You are doing illegal things and you have to, you know, develop gadgetry and special cameras, et cetera, to, you know, pull off what's sort of, uh, you know, an Ocean's Eleven type heist. Social change happens when you have 10% of the population 100% committed to the truth. When you combine the right words, the right moving pictures with the right music and the right story, you have a recipe for being able to get into a person's brain and change not just the way they think, but the way they act. If you're a fan of great documentaries and have enjoyed films like The Game Changers, The Cove, or Racing Extinction, then this episode is your jam because my guest today is the multi-talented director behind those powerful projects, Louis Sahoyos. Prior to taking home an Academy Award for The Cove, Louis was one of the top still photographers in the world working for National Geographic, and he's currently serving as the executive director of the Oceanic Preservation Society. In addition to discussing his remarkable career, as well as his courageous filmmaking style that often places his life and that of his crew in mortal peril, this conversation covers his work as an ardent activist and environmentalist. It's about conservation, it's about sparking change, challenging societal norms, and the power of storytelling as this lever for awareness, for positive change and environmental preservation. Louis is truly the James Bond of filmmaking. It's an honor to know him, and it's a double honor to share his story and powerful perspective with you today. I'm extremely proud to introduce you to our newest brand partner, On. Check out their lineup of super comfortable, sleek, and durable pieces for yourself at On.com. I mean, first of all, thank you for doing this. You know, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. You're a hard man to pin down. You're constantly traveling. You've got a slate of projects that you're, you know, always immersed in. And so, you know, I'm grateful to be able to grab your attention for a little bit here. Um, how do you define for yourself, like what it is that you do? Well, I guess in the most simplistic terms, I'm a photographer slash filmmaker slash writer, um, but I'm really interested in using art media to scale social change. That's what I'm all about. You know, in this business, we're in, you know, outside of Hollywood now, most people, you know, most producers, directors, it's, you know, it's about $10 in a box of popcorn. It's about, you know, butts and seats and how much money can you get from the consumer. And I've always looked at the audience's minds and seats. How do you change a mind? Because the world's a screwed up place. It always mm -hmm. has been to me. And this is my way to try to make it just incrementally you know, uh, a little bit better place. I, I look at like what I do is, it's like I'm a, a first mate with a drunken captain and occasionally I get the controls and while, while he's down sleeping it off, I can go nudge it on a different course. Mm -hmm. And that's by hijacking the public's imagination for something positive, to make positive changes that are scalable. And I've been fortunate to be able to do this with, you know, National Geographic. Um, later on, when I got into films, you know, a fairly successful documentary career doing the same thing, but that's, you know, but ramping it up. And, you know, people always come to us after they see our films, say, the film changed my life. And as well, it's not by accident. I think about that, what we do, and how can you make almost every second up there count on the screen? Because you have a moment in silence to communicate, much like this, with your audience. And they're focused. They're not distracted usually by their phones. They're we're watching your film. They're you know, and if you do a great job, they're not thinking about anything else. If you're doing your job, the whole world disappears for them, and they're focused in on your story. And so we're doing. You know, Mark Twain once said, "The difference between the almost right word and the right word is the difference between the lightning bug and the lightning." And you're a writer. You can you understand that when you're you're sitting there in in the the darkness of your soul, hunting for that word, that sentence, and it all comes together. You go, ah, oh, this is it. This is exactly what I want to say, and that gets communicated with people. Same thing happens with photography. You're trying to find a visual language that is relatable 
and you know because of working with geographic through you know people that speak a lot of different languages. So when you combine the right words, the right pictures, the right moving pictures with the right music and the right story, you have a recipe for being able to get into a person's brain and change not just the way they think, but the way they act. And that's, you know, there's a, there's a term for it that the neurologists call it. Um, I'll think of it in a minute, but it's like- Neuroplasticity. Thank you. Yes. And, you know, and that's, they, they say too, it, it t- only takes about 90 minutes to change the way, some, not just the way people think, but the way they act. Mm. And that's about what our documentaries are. That's just by coincidence. It's not that, you know, we try to make it just that point, but that's usually the, the point where you run out of steam with a documentary. The bridge from changing how somebody thinks to changing how they act, like that's the real like trick to unlock, right? You might be able to shift their perspective momentarily, but, you know, short of some real neuroplastic changes, you're gonna snap back into whatever's convenient or some behavior pattern that you're just inured to over time. There is a, a, a lot of thought that goes, well, first of all, there's there's different kinds of changes, right? There's like scientific changes, you know, um, you know, the, uh, Tony Saba, you know, the, the futurist. Um, he shows a wonderful photograph. I think it's on the Easter parade of 1900 in New York City looking down Broadway. And it's all horses except for one car. And I had a, a great grandmother on my, on my wife's side that lived in New York. She was born in the 1880s, she lived to 104. And she talked about New York being a really unpleasant place to live with all those horses. You imagine 300,000 mm-hmm. horses, 20,000 tons of manure dumped evenly over the streets and, you know, every day. So it goes on to your shoes, it gets into your house and the sidewalks, there's flies everywhere. Sailors could smell it six miles away in New York City. And so when this one car, you can imagine all those people in that photograph that were riding the horses, looking over at that crazy guy with the, with the, mm-hmm. with the car, thinking well, who would be caught dead doing that? And you know, the Easter parade of 1913, when Tony Saba does his talk, it's completely reversed. It's all cars, a single horse. Yeah. And that kind of transformation happens in about 10 year increments. And he said, well, you know, you think that was like a bet when he gave that talk that when I first heard it in about 2010, there was um, an environmental, uh, he was talking to a bunch of environmentalists and I was one of them. And I was like, why don't people, why doesn't the world understand the genius of an electric car? At that point, I had one of the first three electric cars in all of Colorado. I was powered by 114 solar panels. It was a fully electric Toyota, uh, it wasn't a Land Cruiser, the, uh, the like the, the Rav Four, yeah, the yeah. Rav Four, mm-hmm. and you know my license plate said uh, VUS. It was the opposite of SUV. It stood for Vehicle <laughs> Using Sun. Yeah. And did you hang on to that plate? You still have that? I don't. I sold yeah. it. You know, but but, um, but I I remember when Tony gave that talk, he was saying the same thing was happening. He said people aren't programmed for these these big changes that are coming, they happen really quick. And all you, you look back at, you know, the pundits and they're all saying like, you know, it's, it's, it's not scalable, it's not gonna happen. And, you know, when I had it, this that Toyota RAV was a 2002 Toyota RAV. So I was a real early adopter. And, and I remember thinking like, why don't people get it? And Tony said, well, it, it happens very quickly. Most people can't see it coming. I and mean, we got a standing ovation. And I just ran into Tony a couple months ago. And he said, the same thing's happening with plant-based diets. You, there's a, you know, people say it's not scalable. It is, it's totally there. You know, this, the whole agriculture industry runs on just a, a few percentage points of profitability. You take away their subsidies or their profitability. This new thing takes over and all of a sudden the world's changed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, another example he gave is the, you know, remember this is a 2010 talk that he did. And he's talking about the, you know, cell phones, which were just a few years old at that point. He said, remember just a few years ago, 2007, we were hitting the number two key six times on our flip phone to text to capital C. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago, but I think it's also uh, a function of other elements lining up. There's a timing aspect to it too. And I think the electric car is a perfect example of the point I'd like to illustrate, which is there's a difference between what the right thing to do is the altruistic thing, the thing that is in you know everybody's best interest. Um, but it's another thing altogether when that product is packaged in a very aspirational way. And so when Elon Musk comes around and he creates this product that 
suddenly everybody desires because it's better, it looks better, it performs better, it's cool. There's a brand element that you know gets baked into it. Um, that changes the public's perception of this thing that they had always looked at as you know kind of this weird outlier thing that only you know strange people would have in their driveway. Exactly. I mean, be- the economics of it, right? As well as the the marketing and the kind of mindset around it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know Lilani has been on your sure. remote you know, to the race car yeah. drivers on, you know, you've been on this podcast and she's now on my board. And I picked up, we had a, we did a film called Racing Extinction. We had a, we, we, we bought a, I can't remember what it was. I think it was a 2015. Oh man, it had to be. It was a, that. it was a Model S. Oh, it, was yeah, a, it was a, I think it was the, that. one of the original. Model S. Right, one of yeah, the original yeah, Model yeah. S's. And it was the first Model S to have a, yeah. a vegan, you know, leather seats. Anyway, it, yeah, it'll be way before t- 2015 because in 2012, we were going to be interviewing Elon Musk in October. And I remember he, him giving me a call and saying, can we make it for uh, December instead? And at that point, I was like, uh, you know, a little bit, you know, let down that, you know, we're not going to do the interview when I thought we were going to, he said, I said, sure, but why? He said, well, I could go bankrupt. Now, 10 years later, yeah, he's the richest guy in the world, you know, so... I'm hoping that there's there's changes coming and there's changes coming quick. And, you know, it does have, there's a process to it. Like you're doing it for the, you know, the, the right reasons. And then at, when society gets to about 30% of a, adoption, then other people are doing it just because other people are doing it. Mm-hmm. So 70% of the population is really, they're followers, which is fine, but they're, they're not doing it for all the same reasons. They're just doing it because it's cool. But Lilani Mutter, when she, we drove that car off the, the Tesla lot. You know, this is remember, this is a woman who is comfortable driving, you know, gasoline powered cars at 200 miles an hour at, you know, Daytona and Talladega racetracks. And we weren't a mile outside the the lot and she goes or the the factory and she turns to me and said, every other car on the road just became a relic. And it took it's taken, you know, a good 10 years for it to, to happen. But those are the same increments that mm-hmm. Tony Sable was talking yeah. about. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, well, I wanna I wanna talk about the changes that are happening and the changes that are needed, but I wanna stick to this uh, idea that you're introducing around the power of storytelling to to provoke change at scale. And, you know, I think you represent, you know, an interesting creator in the space of documentary filmmaking. And when I think about the history of documentaries, it also wasn't that long ago that documentaries were sort of considered an art form in which an objective person would tell a story from different points of view. And there seemed to be a premium or an expectation on this idea of objectivity, right? And it wasn't until, and maybe that's not true, maybe that's just, apocryphal because everybody's subjective and everybody who would be interested in enough, enough in a subject matter to make a documentary about it probably has a point of view that they're trying to express. But in popular culture, it wasn't really until Michael Moore came around and started making these mainstream documentaries where he had a very strong point of view that that kind of shifted the fulcrum of what a documentary could be. And you're somebody who goes into these subject matters and and and, and these terrains very intentional about what you want to say and the story that you want to tell to provoke a certain type of of reaction in the audience. Yeah, I mean, I went to journalism school and that was the the goal back then, right? You you tell both sides of the story, like there's only two sides to a story. Um, but certainly all the writers I was interested in, the photographers I was interested in, all those authors of those original content had an opinion. It's like, you know, they, they said something, they had something to say. It wasn't, you know, the facts. It's like, you know, you can go get the facts. I want to know what you're thinking, right? That's the, the cool part. Not just tell me about like, who are the players? What are their interests? What are, you know, what are their goals? What are they trying to do? And then they have somebody with an opinion. It's like, okay, then I, I can still take an, a, another, the opposite opinion, but I want to know what they think. And that's di- quite different than being, you know, an objective truth seeker. Right. And what I'm trying to do is, yeah, I, I, I got to say, when we did, you know, the first one I worked on was called The Cove. And I, I went out with that intention, like get their side of the story. When I, I went to Taiji, Japan, where they you know, were killing more dolphins than any other place on the planet, I was there with the intention of not showing what goes on in The Cove. I went to the, the mayor of the town and the city council, sat with them for five hours the first day and seven hours the second day with the 
the Dolphin Hunting Union because I just wanted to get one person to come on camera and just talk about what they do. And I was going to do this bigger story about ocean health. I wasn't interested in that. But when they wouldn't talk to me, you know, after investing all that time of like, you know, why won't you talk to us? I was like, they must be hiding something. There's a story there that might be worth telling. And I remember sitting above this park, it's called Tsunami Park, above the cove and looking down on it and thinking like, what goes on in there would be really interesting. And then I had this like, I can remember this, this feeling, this light bulb moment, like if we can sneak in there and show it, that would be exciting. Mm-hmm. And I just, I remember that all became very, it, everything came into focus to me. It's like us getting in to photograph that is, would be so exciting if you could transfer the excitement that I was feeling to the audience. Now that's a story. Right. No matter what happens right. in there. And you, you certainly accomplished that. I mean, it has this narrative three act structure and it operates, you've said this before, people have described it as sort of uh, Jason Bourne meets Flipper. Uh, and it's it's it, it does function like a thriller where your lives are at stake, you are doing illegal things, there is a very real threat hanging over you at all times, and and you have to you know develop gadgetry and special cameras, et cetera, to you know pull off what's sort of uh, you know an Ocean's Eleven type heist to get this footage to document the atrocities that are happening you know in that cove. So maybe explain a little bit about you know Taiji and what was going on there and and what it was that you were you know kind of pulling covers on. Yeah, well, I mean, it all started, I was, um, I mean, if we can go back, I mean, the origin story of OPS, my organization, and I'll try to get quickly to Rickleberry and the Cove is um, my best- You don't have fr- to go quickly. Oh, okay, we got cool. time. Okay, well. Because um, the story is, the more I dive into your life, you're, you're quickly becoming the most interesting man alive. And, <laughs> and in case I forget, I want to talk about your photography career later, because uh, I don't feel like people uh, appreciate that chapter of your career because it's been so overshadowed by what you do now, but there's some really amazing stuff there too. Yeah, I mean, I was I was a good photographer. I mean, I was, a, I was the first new photographer in National Geographic hired in more than a decade. This is back in 1980. And, you know, the first, I've been a champion of lost co- causes even before that. Well, you, and, were, you were winning photography awards when you were like 14 and 15. Right. You started working, you know, in that field and Newspapers, you got a scholarship yeah. to University of Missouri uh, and there was a sponsor to your scholarship. Oh, Goldfinger? Yeah, the <laughs> real life Goldfinger. So like the whole Ian Fleming thing that, you mm-hmm. know, becomes kind of a recurring, you know, motif in your films, that seed was planted when you were very young, which I find fascinating. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, this it's, it's been an interesting trajectory. Um, I mean, I don't know how far you want to go back, but you know, that was like, you know, when I was a kid, just, you know, delivering newspapers as like a 12 year old with wagons, you know, 75, like Sunday, you know, mm-hmm. newspapers up hills. And you're, you're waiting as a kid at four in the morning on a Sunday morning for, for the, the news, you know, your papers to come off, your batch of papers to come off the press. So you smell the ink, you see the news coming and you, you're part of that delivery system, albeit just a, you know, like a, a newspaper boy, but you're still feel part of that system at, a, at the very, very lowest yeah. ranks. So delivering the papers gave me like a really interesting background in that little town newspaper in Dubuque, Iowa, they had a, a really cracked team of photographers that were winning national contests. And I thought this, you know, you, the first thing you do is you see the front page and sure. they have a bigger picture. You know, it was like the photo staff was run by a managing editor that used to be a photographer. So it got prominence. And so that played into that, you know, that whole, a childhood thing. So I started working for that newspaper when I was 14. That was my first mm-hmm. internship with them. I did that for a couple of years. And then, um, but then, yeah, I mean, at Geographic, there was a famous, <laughs> there was a famous director of photography, Bob Gilka, I actually named my son after him. He was like a, a, a father figure to him, to me. And I wrote him, a you know, back then they took two internships by portfolio where you gave him, you know, mm-hmm. sample your work and one by winning college photographer of the year. So a junior year in college, I sent a portfolio and he wrote me a nice, a really nice handwritten letter back saying, uh, you know, kid, you know, internships for, are for kids that aren't, you know, good enough to work. You're good enough to get in the, you know, in the industry, good mm. luck. And I thought, oh God, I always wanted to work for National Geographic my entire life. Like, you know, not that was, was that my one shot. And then, uh, so I realized there was the one shot I had left was to win college photographer of the year. And 
Um, so I just applied myself. I was actually working here in town at the LA Times as, a, as an intern. And it just like, you know, it was just, you know, 24 seven. That's all I wanted to do, like news and sports. And that wasn't ego so much, maybe mostly when I was a kid, but I'd like, I just loved to shoot, mm-hmm. you know? And, and when you're working for a newspaper, you can do everything. And, you know, as a 20 year old kid with, or I don't know, maybe an 18 year old kid with all that energy, you just like, you know, the staffers were like, hey kid, you got to take time off. It's like, you're making us all look bad. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I- You can get I, away with it. You got the energy. Uh, but I won that, that contest. I won like every category that there was in the college photographer of the year. So Gilka had to hire me for the summer. And I ended up doing a black and white story on the Potter River Basin, which was a, a, an energy part of the a developing energy cold, town area, you know, the, mm-hmm. the Potter River Basin. And then um, it was being, you know, it was formal ranch land, but now it's like, you know, coal property. And I, you know, that was rated the best story of the issue. I, um, and I was, a, that was the, that was my internship was gonna be over. And there's this friend of mine who was laying out the magazine, uh, Bill Dothit, and he's a little bit older than me. And he had a wicked sense of humor. And we would, back then, Geographic had, 1980, had this relentlessly optimistic viewpoint about everything. They could make Uganda look like back then with the Civil War going on, look like a great place to live. Mm. And we'd make fun out of the magazine. Like they do a story on like a couple walks across America, you know, to find the real America. We'd, yeah, we'd, I, know, I, know the, I know the son of those people. I know that issue, go ahead. <laughs> and we'd do like bulldozer across America. <laughs> yeah. And, and we'd, we'd, yeah. we'd think of all the, you know, the pictures that you would do. Like, the you counter know, narrative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, he came up with a, the story like our friend the maggot life goes on inside a corpse. You get the idea. Mm-hmm. And one day we were watching, towards the end of my internship, we were watching uh, uh, this person, you know, haul the trash across the, the lunchroom, and he said, "Oh, we should do a story about you know garbage, you know." And I and there could be a, like somebody looking, you know, at the at modern garbage. And I said, oh, "I know this guy Bill Ratch. I just read about him. Who was a garbologist? He was a Mayan archaeologist, and he's." He looks at modern garbage to see what people throw away and mm. study it. And, and he said, well, we could do something on, you know, there's a guy, Fred Ward, who did um, commodity stories for the magazine. He did like gold, silver, platinum, you know, and I said, we could do garbage. And there was like a Fred Ward style where he'd always have like art that was done, right. you know, with, and then, uh, you know, he said, well, we could do like garbage art. And I said, well, I just remember reading about this colony of like artists up in Northern California that were taking art from garbage and making it into you know, sellable art. And so we proposed the story and, you know, Geographic took it and then they hired me. But but back then, and, and you know, the idea wasn't just to do a story. It's like in 1980, there wasn't any mandatory recycling program in all of America. There's one. There's one in, I think, in Mountain View, California. And uh, that, to me, that was insane that we're throwing away aluminum and paper and glass and not even a hope of recycling when the rest of the world they have, you know, they are recycling. They're doing, you know, I called the story urban ore. And so the idea is how do you take something that's, you know, people aren't thinking about and make it interesting. And that story became the most popular story of that year. Mm-hmm. And so the Geographic ended up hiring me after it got published. Well, you know, to not after it got published, but, you know, to, to do that story. And then I just kept on doing stories that, you know, had this sort of lost Right. Well, you were, so you were the youngest ever uh, full-time photographer hired by Nat Geo. And also they hadn't hired a photographer in like 10 years, right? Right. So it's not a small thing. Um, And there was some quote about like, well, if this kid can make garbage look beautiful, like we (laughs) we need to, you know, tie him up. He's gonna, he's gotta work here. But that idea of, you know, taking something that people don't think about and, making them think about it or turning it into something beautiful. I mean, that, that is also a, a, a recurring kind of motif in the films. Like this sensibility was yeah. there from the get-go. Yeah, and, and I can remember thinking like, you know, all my friends were at, you know, my colleagues at that, that time were thinking, they were taking stuff that would be intrinsically interesting. You know, like animals. Was uh-huh. like, and I was, I, it, my mindset back then was, like, how easy is that? You know, to 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 photograph something that everybody wants to see. The trick to me was like, how do you take something that nobody wants to look at mm. and do the reverse of it, make it interesting because mm-hmm. they need to. You mm-hmm. know, we need to look at it, and it just changed the mindset. Now, of course, I know there's a there's a huge amount of talent and research that goes into making anything looks look amazing. But back then, like. 
you know, I wasn't trying to do stories on Paris or, you know, these, you know, beautiful places on the right. planet. I was looking at, you know, the worst places and try to make it look interesting or right. try to, you know, find something in, in it that was, that made us think about ourselves. But at some point you, you, you pivot into portraiture of like all these um, high net worth, tech people, right? Like part of this information revolution and you start working for Fortune and other publications. Yeah, in 1997, I, I basically uh, called it quits with National Geographic for a lot of different reasons. You can Google it, <laughs> uh -oh. but uh, no, it was, it was okay. It was, it was all right. It was, we parted on a good company, but anyway, I made this transition to, to re working, you know, shooting covers for Fortune magazine, which was, you know, it might seem like a downgrade after National Geographic, but you know, you, I was meeting, I've always been interested in, you know, innovators and I was meeting some of the most, you know, interesting people on the planet, you know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, um, Andy Grove, you know, all the, one point I'd photographed, you know, seven of the top 10 richest people in the world. And it's not mm. just that they're rich, it's just that all those people are doing something interesting for, for culture because, and they've got this other kind of drive and other kind of mindset. But the person I wanted to meet most back then, uh, well, actually when I started working for Geographic, I did a story in the information revolution. This was started researching in 1993. And Jim Clark was a kind of a combination of of uh, probably Elon Musk and Steve Jobs. He was the only person at that point that had taken three industries from scratch and made them all worth over a billion dollars. Uh, Silicon Graphics was the um, the first three D graphics engine. The way that you could create mm -hmm. you know any on a computer in real time in three D, but Changed was, Hollywood, changed a lot of industries. It allowed it, you to like model your designs. Right, right? yeah, and ga gaming could mm -hmm. be done in, in real time. Uh, the day he quit that, he started Netscape, the first commercial internet browser. And then he started WebMD, which is a way that revolutionized the healthcare industry by digitizing it. Because most, about 75% of the transactions you do are actually involved in just the clerical work of mm -hmm. like, you know, the, taking those forms and making them digital. He said, well, why don't you just do a digital in the first place and doctors can you know, find out the latest research and he did all that. So Fortune, I couldn't photograph him for, for National Geographic. He was just way too busy. And then I don't know, fast forward like five or six years when I'm working for Fortune, they said, do you want to go photograph Jim Clark? He's built this new boat over in Amsterdam. I said, God, I wanted to meet this guy forever. And so I went over there. And uh, Jim had just built this boat that, you know, everything could be controlled by the computer. It was like the world's largest, you know, mast at that point, beautiful sailing boat. You know, he had like a Picasso from the blue period in the living room. <laughs> he had a, you know, Rodin sculpture. Hyperion, right? Is that, yeah. Like the mast was like 200 feet tall or something like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, like uh, hey, it was 192 or something mm -hmm. like that. Michael Lewis uh, did a book on right. him called The New New Thing. I was on that voyage from Africa to Antigua. Um, but... But the point is like, oh, when I went to go meet Jim, he was starting a fourth company called Shutterfly, the way you can take digital mm. prints and make analog you know, prints out of them. And he, he wanted to become a, a good photographer. So Louie, would you teach me how to be a good photographer? And I said, Jim, I'll teach you how to be a great one if you teach me how to be a billionaire. <laughs> and he would, he would literally pick me up on his plane and we'd fly all over the world and take pictures, mostly underwater. And at that point he was digital. And I was like one of the last people to, you know, not do Kodachrome mm. because that was the best film out there. And I was like, why would you do a seven or 12 megapixel camera when you can shoot still with, you know, it wasn't that I was a snob about it. It's just, it wasn't as Tech good. It wasn't there yet. And there was a medium format technology is so you have 35 millimeter, which is kind of like, you know, what we used at Geographic, what a, you know, a, an amateur would use, a professional amateur would use it too, a 35 millimeter film, but medium format sensor is better, right? The bigger, the better. Yeah. And the same has always been true with film as well. Four by five negative is better than a 35 millimeter negative, four by five inch. And Jim said, why doesn't somebody build a camera, like a good camera for medium format for underwater? I said, well, it's too expensive. Well, anyway, Jim built one for me. Mm. He built like the world's best underwater camera. It's still the best underwater camera ever made. And we'd go around the world and, and film with it. And that was our job. You know, that was like, I was hanging out with him, going around the world, shooting mostly underwaters. And every time that we went to a new location, I remember he said, I'm gonna take you to the best dive site I've ever been to. It was in, off Papua New Guinea. We fly there, his boat's waiting for us. We sail for about a day and a half. I wake up in the morning and there's these kids looking through the porthole window. They were in these little dugout ca canoes. You know, we we're in the middle of nowhere. This yeah. is like an alien spaceship had just yeah. come. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we 
I remember we went out in the dinghies and Jim said, I'll go down first to make sure we're in the right spot. We, we, he dove on the GPS coordinates and he comes back up and he's like in tears. He said, I said, what's, what's up? He said, it's gone. It, you know, probably dynamite fishing or a bleaching event, but it was completely gone. Mm. And everywhere we had, you know, we remember we did this for about oh, almost 10 years, nine years diving around the world. And every time you go back to a place, you can see this degradation go on. There's less fish. You see, we came up from a dive in the Galapagos in a marine sanctuary and we were surrounded by illegal fishing boats. <sighs> and I remember he said something to me like, you know, somebody should do something about this. I said, well, how about you and I? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, we'll use your money and my eye and we'll make films. Because we had talked about, you know. Yeah, we, you must have had been thinking about that prior to him raising it though. Yeah, and he was, you know, thinking about it too. He was he was looking at the, the photographs we were doing and I would do, you know, I'd take a, a little um, video camera down and I'd make as, as, a re, as a kind of a thank you to him, I'd make mm. these little five minute shorts, you know, of, of our yeah. trip. And they were pretty good. I really put some time into them and made him, made him feel like- This was oh, your film school. That was my film school. Yeah. Well, actually the film school came with, so he decides to bankroll me, right? To, you know, in this this nonprofit venture, right? You know, this is his idea of making me a billionaire. He's going to put me in a non <laughs> nonprofit yeah. business, and we'll do films. Yeah, is he is he living up to his side of the bargain on this? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, I got to say, I do feel like the richest guy in the world right uh -huh. now because you know we can talk about that later. But there's nothing there's nothing quite like being able to do what you want to do, which he's he's allowed me to do, which is try to, you know, do what I'm trying to do to change the world at scale. And he allowed me, he greased the way to make that happen. Now remember that, that like I'm, I'm a, a you know, pretender syndrome or imposter syndrome, right? I'm like, I'm never made a, a film before, you know, beyond a five minute little, mm -hmm. you know, family short, you know, family film. And I'm thinking, God, what am I gonna take my buddy's money? And you see, when you're in that world, you start to see friends come and go because they have a new business prospect and they're, right. you know, they, they don't live up to it. And so I'm thinking, oh God, I could be one of those jerks that gets money out mm -hmm. of the, the rich friend and then doesn't deliver. I remember we were on a new boat that he did. It was the world's largest private sailboat. It's called Athena. And we're down in the Caribbean with our families on the boat. And my kid must've been about, I don't know, nine years old at that point, my son, Sam, he's playing on the beach with another kid, happens to be Steven Spielberg's kids, one of his kids. And uh, Steven comes over to Jim's boat to me. He did dress, Steven did Jurassic Park with, yes. you know, I'm the Silicon graphics. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so they, yeah, no, know. he used, yeah, he used Jim's equipment to make his big movies. Right, yeah. which was the first breakthrough movie, right? So they were yeah. already buddies then, I would, I would imagine. No, they never met each other. Oh, which is, they, they knew of each other, but you, you just know, think they weren't. People at that, in, you know, who are orbiting at that altitude kind of all know each other. Yeah, yeah well, but for the next week we were hanging out together, right? Mm -hmm. It was, you know, Spielberg's family would come over to the boat and I was always trying to craft away like to get him alone for a second so I could tell you like, do you have any advice for a first time filmmaker? And when I did, he said, yeah, never make a movie involving boats or animals. And I'm starting the Oceanic <laughs> Preservation Society. Yeah. And you know, everything- Nothing I'm, but that. <laughs> yeah, and of course then we, you know, the first film we do is The Cove and it's about dolphin hunting and like, how are you gonna make that into a film? And the film that Jim and I, set, you know, we, we set off to make was actually the second film, Racing Extinction. And the dolphin hunting was gonna be just part of it. It wasn't gonna be, you know, a whole movie in itself. It was only after we started, you know, doing this undercover footage in Taiji, Japan, that we realized that there was a, a way to t talk about what was going on there in that film and talk about the oceans, this bigger story. And that was kind of the aha moment. Every athlete I know is gonna tell you that having the right gear is key to performance. If what you're wearing is poorly crafted, it's just gonna put distance between you and those goals you've set. You owe it to yourself to invest in the best and the best is on. I'm obsessed with the Cloud Ultra, great on the trails. And I just got the new next gen Cloud Stratus 3 for the road, I'm loving those. But On also has this incredible line of lightweight, high performance apparel that is just beyond anything I've previously donned. It's like this second to none, second skin. I love to rock the sweat wicking ultra tee and the ultra shorts, which have this pocket right at the base of the spine that perfectly anchors your phone, no jiggle. I'm just so proud to partner with On and I love their vision for the future where their gear is fossil free and engineered for circularity. 
So check out their amazing lineup of super comfortable, sleek, and durable pieces for yourself at on.com. It's really smart because by limiting your focus or narrowing your focus on one specific um, situation or event that allows you to talk about the broader issues at play creates a situation in which you can you can drive that level of emotional engagement and get people to really care when it's difficult to do that when you're at 10,000 feet and you're you know shooting statistics at them and you're kind of toggling back and forth from all different places all over the world it's that idea of like the world stops when you know, there's one girl at the bottom of a well somewhere in, you know, I don't know, some remote village, uh, but we, you know, are challenged to even blink when we see a headline about a genocide somewhere that's far away from where we live. Yeah, Christoph was, you know, from the writer for the New York Times, he said that like, you know, if you could, you know, get the audience to care about one person, then at the end of it, you know, he's always saying, but there's 3 million just like her. Yeah. You know, that was, that's the key, isn't it? To find that emotional hook. And then you're still bringing in those big picture 20, you know, 10,000 foot views, Mm -hmm. you know, as the stakes, you know, in the cove, you know, it's about what they're doing, which is horrible, but it's also in that film, we talk about overfishing because the fishermen in Taiji, they rationalize that they're killing the dolphins because they're eating all their fish. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, the dolphins eating their own fish. It's, right. the, you know, the 145 million people in Japan that eat yeah. almost nothing but, mm-hmm. and all the Americans and, you know, the eight and a half billion people on the, or eight billion people on the planet now, a lot of them are pescatarians. And, you know, this is, these are wild animals. You know, it's like- I believe those fishermen did believe that though. I do too, I, I think, but- you, Or they you, had to believe it in order to actually perpetrate those atrocities. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all do that, right? We all rationalize a lot of our- um, bad behavior because of you know, whatever I need to make mm-hmm. a living, you know, the social good. I, I remember this is a funny story. Like we were making the cove and I was going down to the IWC, the International Whaling Commission meeting down in Chile. And I wanted to interview the director of the, the IWC for Japan. And was, his name was Akira Nakamai. And this is why I know that if there is a God, he has a, 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 he, she, they have a good sense of humor. So I'm on a flight from Dallas down to Chile and they're holding the plane and the plane is completely filled up. I can't even sit with my crew. And, but there's one seat empty next to me. And the last person to the ex- exit the door, we've been waiting for him to get onto another plane is Akira Nakamai. And he comes down, he sits down right next to me. And I'm looking at my crew like, do you have any, like, <laughs> they're looking at like, oh my God, like of, of all the, you know, all the gin joints in all the world, you know, and I waited till the plane took off because I didn't want him to be able to switch with maybe somebody that, you know, from his own team was on the film, on the plane. And then when we had dinner served, I turned to him, I said, do you have any idea who I am? And he goes, no, he says, I know who you are. I want to show you a film. And we had like a 17 minute cut of the cove that was like a sizzle reel. And this goes back to, okay, here's the guy that's responsible for dolphin quotas and whale quotas in Japan. Uh, about a week or two before, they were just caught illegally fish, fishing bluefin to the tune of you know th- hundreds of tons mm-hmm. of illegally caught bluefin tuna. And so I had this opportunity to ask him, you know, every, anything I wanted to ask him, he's right there, where's he gonna go? He's a captive audience. I'm gonna say, you're, you're the guy that's, now back then, remember this, if you haven't seen the, the cove, you know, part of the premise is that the dolphin meat is all toxic. That's where we, we win. It's not just a matter of, you know, there's our beautiful sentient animals. Well, what are you doing killing them? Their meat's toxic. And they were force feeding it to school kids in Japan. By force feeding, it, you know, be, you had to eat everything on your plate when you were a kid. You couldn't right. bring in they, your own they, lunch. They make you clean your plate and you couldn't bring your own lunch, right? Yeah. Like you and had to eat the mandated lunch. Yeah. And it was so it was, dolphin it was, meat. It was poison. I mean, yeah. literally it was poison. It had anywhere to from five to 5,000 times more mercury if it was a fish, of course it's a mammal. So um, they got by with this loophole. And I said to Akira Nakama, I said, you're the guy that's responsible for, and they had a plan to school, to uh, put, dolphin meat on school lunch pro- programs all over Japan, right, right before this happened. And I said, 
you're giving dopamine laced with mercury. That's extremely deleterious effects to especially young kids. I said, how do you reconcile with what you're doing? He said, well, I'm charged of food security, not food safety. Going yeah. back to your thing, like we all make rationalizations. The cognitive dissonance that you have to engage with to just get up in the morning and do your job. But that that's the, is that the same guy in the cove with like the grayish longer longer hair? No, that was his boss. No, uh, that, uh, Shoji, that was worked underneath Akira. Mm. Yeah. That and was, that was it. End of <laughs> end of discussion. Well, with that? yeah. I mean, he agreed to once we got to to well, and his argument would be, food security is an important issue in Japan because it's an island nation. They don't have, you know, grazing pasture lands like we have, et cetera. And it is a challenge to make sure that the however many hundred million plus people that live in Japan have adequate uh, access to. Food. Yeah, you could have written his playbook. That's yeah, exactly know, right? what he told me. <laughs> he said, he said, he said, we have 145 million people in Japan, about the same size as your California. Only 17 percent of our land is habitable to put our, you know, homes and, mm-hmm. and businesses. We have to look to the sea for our, our food. That's why we're illegally fishing tuna. That's why we're, you know, looking to, you know, to eat whales when the rest of the the world right. is and just brazen with the fact that they're transgressing all of these laws. Yeah, it, mm. yeah. So that's, you know, there was a rationale for everything. It is so challenging. I I rewatched the Cove last night to to watch those scenes um, where you get these cameras into this Cove, which is really, you know, basically they they corral these dolphins for people who haven't seen the movie into this particular Cove. They do that by banging on pipes and dolphins being very um, sensitive to sound. Out of fear, uh, you know, they they sort of push them into this cove, and then they rope it off with nets, and then they just slaughter most of them, and they pick out a few that they they then sell to the um, you know the, inter- the, the sort of marine in- entertainment complex, correct? And those yeah. those those animals fetch a pretty price, and the rest are used for food. Exactly, and they make most. I think a dead dolphin, you know, on the meat counter sells for about $600 or used to $600 a piece. And then a trained dolphin can sell for 150,000, maybe right. a quarter of a million now. And so that's the, the economics of it. And it's a very small town and that really plays into, you know, it makes a lot of money for that industry, for the, you know, the, for that town, you know, by serving that industry. So those, those dolphins will go to the Middle East mostly and China and Japan. I think Japan had at that time over 50 dolphinariums Mm-hmm. The film ends up getting criticized for, uh, you know, kind of taking shots at, at at like their culture, right? Like this is our culture. How dare you? You slaughter pigs and cows, etc. Um, also, this food security issue sort of is used or deployed as a as a you know counterpoint to the issues that you're raising. Um, but what's interesting is is what you realize is that most people in Japan don't know this is going on. People in Taiji don't even know it's going on. And Taiji is this town that's like draped in all this iconography around whales and dolphins. Like they're celebrating these beautiful animals, we but love, right underneath dolphins, their feet. Right. Yeah, yeah, like this is what's actually happening. So Japan itself, the, the normal citizen in Japan appeared to be just as surprised as any audience member who who would watch your film. Yeah, I mean, we got that early on, like, you know, culinary imperialism, they call it. And, you know, th- there's a certain amount of truth to that. But, you know, if your kids were being force fed toxic meat or toxic vegetables at your school, wouldn't you be thrilled that anybody from any country would come in and, and tell you what's what when your country is mm-hmm. covering it up? You know, yeah, that's why the mercury argument is is the strongest one in terms of you know kind of overriding everything else. Yeah, uh, Rick and I, Rick Rickleberry is the you know the, the protagonist of the film. He's the guy who captured and trained the five female dolphins that collectively played the part of Flipper for the Flipper TV series. We had a you know kind of a, a running thing between us. Whenever we talked to the Japanese media, we tried to use the word mercury in every sentence so they couldn't cut it out. 
They say, well, mm-hmm. like, oh, what about cows, pigs, and chickens? Well, I say, well, if, if your, our chickens had that much mercury. Uh, you know, what, you know, we'd always right. like try to the, the, or create a way to try to bring it back to mercury because that was their Achilles heel. They, they couldn't, you couldn't argue. Mercury is good. Mercury is good for kids. Mm-hmm. You know, they had yeah. that. You know, the first big industrial accident in the world that was announced was you know Minamata Bay. Mer- you know. You know uh, Minamata disease. It's not a disease. They were in t- this company called Chiso uh, Minamata was intentionally dumping mercury into the bay and infecting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And that got discovered in the 1950s. And you know, th- so mercury poison. They, they, they were found to be guilty. Mm-hmm. And there were all these birth defects, pregnant women ingesting this, and yeah, I can remember there was a, there was a researcher I think from mm-hmm. America that was studying mercury poisoning here in America, and he went over to Japan. Remember, this is post World War II, and that part of Japan you couldn't easily get to. I don't think there was roads back then, so he got there by boat and he got to this this bay, and everybody looked like they had mercury poisoning. It's like, you can imagine, like it's really def- looks like you're deformed. You know, all sorts of birth defects. So it hits the older people too, but the kids have the most deleterious effect. Mm. And so that's how it was discovered. The government was helping this company try to cover it up. They, found, they were found guilty. So mercury is a trigger word. Right, so in Japan, them. everybody knows about this. Yeah, it's Yeah, a big and they're deal. sensitive to it. And then on a personal level, I mean, this is part of your own kind of, Awakening your own mercury poisoning. Yeah, well, the the we, I interviewed the doctor who uh, developed a test to find out how much damages the people that were affected are due, and he d- developed something called a two point nodal test, which is like a protractor with two points on it, and depending on the distance you can feel the two points on a fingertip, he could pretty accurately tell you how much mercury poison you had. Then he showed me the mm. corollary of what that would, because he had the brains of people after they died, they would you know, take their brains out and he had brain slices and it looked like Swiss cheese. It would literally dull up holes in your brain. Wow. And I remember asking him, was like, what's, what's that mean to have this disease? And he slowly, he said, it slowly erases what it means to be human. It takes away your senses, it takes away your memory, your sense of touch. Your, your sense of hearing, you know, all your senses start to go. And then when, Terrifying. you know, so this this is in my mind. Now, at that time, I was a pescatarian. I ate fish and I was, I was delighted to be in Japan because I could eat fish, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I wasn't like, you know, when I was working for Fortune Magazine, I did a, a, a story on the biggest independently owned slaughterhouses in America. And one was in Oklahoma and it was so big, they had their own slaughterhouse, like 500 cows a day would go through there. And I spent several hours there. And one of these cows, if you ever know about the process, you know, there's a, there's a reason why they say if slaughterhouses had glass walls, yeah. maybe it'd be, you know. Hence the uh, gag laws. Yeah. And they, they put what's called a captive bolt to the, the head of a cow and that's supposed to kill them instantly. And I remember this one cow was, they, they put him, they chain him up by his back heels and they rip off the hide. And then they start to slowly, as it goes around through these, it's like, it's like the reverse of a car manufacturing plant. They're deassembling the cow right. you know, at stations instead of putting it together. And remember mm-hmm. this cow comes by at the first turn and it's turning its head as looking at me, hanging upside down and realized it was still conscious. It was still skinned headed. alive and still alive. Yeah, it must with have a missed. bolt in its head, but not dead. Not like a old country, uh, no country for old men. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was it was horrifying. Uh, and I thought I can't be part of this industry, but I ate fish. I thought, well, I'll have to eat. You have to eat fish mm-hmm. to be, you know, human. You have to have animal products. So I, I ate fish. I thought, well, they're going to be less sentient, intelligent. And uh, so I was a pescatarian. So this is 1986, and this is when I'm doing the Cove would have been like 2007 and something like that, 2008. And I remember I was eating a lot of fish back then. I thought, well, I should have, one of the last scenes we do in the movie is we take the deputy minister of the fisheries, Hideki Morinuki, and we take a hair sample. Cause he, could, he can do blood samples, mm-hmm. or you can do hair samples to figure out how much mercury somebody, somebody has. So we clipped his hair, you know, with, with, with his permission. And I sent it in, he took it into his lab and he's, I didn't tell him whose samples they were, but he said he, he said Hideki's sample was like eight times higher than what's considered too high. Wow! And uh, he said he said who's this other sample? I said it's mine. He says, well, yours is forty four times higher. 
Ooh. And having seen what it does to the brain of somebody with mercury poisoning, I just, the shock went through me like. And you're in the middle of making this movie about this very subject. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what, what and then also, what, what am I going to eat? Yeah. You know, cause like, I, I, I would imagine it's probably like what the Japanese would have thought. What are you, what are you going to eat if you can't eat fish? And I remember, so that we, I, I remember we, I had to cut out you know, eating fish because it wasn't it wasn't a joke. It wasn't just like something I do later because to me it was real palpable to to see the brain slices and say that this could be done. Mm-hmm. Be, be going on with mine. You were asymptomatic though. I had I had symptoms. I had mm-hmm. like uh, a short term memory loss. I had this pain in my shoulder that was persistent would never go away. I thought it was like from lifting ca- cameras or something. And when I stopped eating fish, it has a half life in your body, mercury of about 70 to 90 days. And after a couple months, it went away. And I was like, oh, sh- wow, this is serious. And I was here for the Academy Awards. We were doing this, this run up, you know, the, all the media mm-hmm. push. And I remember sitting with uh, Rebecca Meek. She was a designer, a vegan, you know, clothing designer. She was like a friend of this guy that I, that I met. And I wasn't, she was, I was at, happened to be at, at lunch with her and she starts ordering off the menu working with the waiter to try to you know, make a, a, a dish. That, and I was like, are you vegetarian? She goes, no, I'm vegan. I go, what do you eat? She goes, everything else. Uh-huh. <laughs> and she, you know, she explained that, you know, th- that's where do you think the animals get their protein? Where do they get their nutrients from? And when her dish came, it looked better than anything that we all had on our plates. And um, that was it. I think the, that was the, it. That the, was your your lightning bolt, the aha uh, moment. Yeah, yeah, of like, okay, you don't have to do this. Interesting. It's interesting that that happened in the wake of making that movie and not prior to it. Like you had your own journey with all of this. Uh, too long. That's yeah. too stupid. You know, there's a, there's a line. I think it was one of the best lines in the movie from Rick O'Berry. He said, I was as ignorant as I could be for as long as I could be. Yeah. About what he's talking about when he was training dolphins. That guy's tra- amazing. Um, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember Flipper and I loved Flipper. I had a, uh, my favorite thing when I was a kid, I had a brass uh, belt buckle that was a dolphin. Like I was, it's still my spirit animal. Like I just love dolphins. And his story just haunts me of, training those five dolphins to be flipper for that show. Um, and, you know, believing that he was, what he was doing was ethically sound at the time. And then when the show's over, the dolphins get, um, you know, sent away to these, uh, were they, were they, they weren't, they weren't going to like SeaWorld, right? But they were going to tank so, somewhere. Uh, Miami Seaquarium. Yeah, oh, yeah they, oh, that's where they were. And yeah. then he goes and he visits Catherine. Was that the name of the, Kathy, the main yeah. one, Kathy? And Kathy pops up and they lock eyes. Kathy looks at him, takes a breath and goes down to the bottom of the tank and decides not to take another breath. And dolphins being animals that, that don't have an involuntary kind of breath impulse, it's a choice, basically commits suicide, yeah. which is just, I can't stop thinking about that. It gives me chills still. And whenever I see that part of the movie and, and it's like, it's those kind of moments, like if you're doing a big f- f- film, let's say on ocean health, you don't have that. I mean, that feeling that you have right now that hopefully the audience feels like this animal committing suicide, swam into his arms, looked at him in the eyes and swam down to the bottom of the tank, committed suicide. You know, you can imagine what it would be like to be that, you know, that animal. You can, you can imagine like, I, mean, I think everybody can imagine what it would be like to be alone without your own species mm-hmm. in a, a miserable tank, you know. And all, you know, at that moment, you're with Rick. You'll, you want him to succeed. You're, you know, he becomes a hero right then. And those transformational moments, you just can't get when you're just doing a normal documentary, let's say in the, in the Nova way, yeah. you know, and I don't want to criticize Nova. I watch all those, you know, Novas. I watch, you know, the Marvel films. The, the, the Attenborough sort of style of, of documentary nature storytelling. Yeah, and, and Attenborough for a long time. I mean, I watch those documentaries too, but you know, and I've been to those places that he's talking about and he, in those oases, those ever diminishing oases 
where you can see the the sardine run, you can see the 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 migration. They're still out there, albeit now it's going through more urban areas, and it is, mm-hmm. you can still make it. If you frame it, you can make it look like they're still there. And to the audience, you're doing a little bit of a disservice by saying it, it, the the world is you know isn't changed. It's a bit like greenwashing because it makes us feel better about what's happening when we see that beauty and then we're less likely to take action. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's my feeling. I mean, I, 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 again, I love watching, you know, all those, those wildlife documentaries. I, I love the, the courage that it takes to be embedded with these animals and, and see them on their own terms. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm going, what can I do to try to halt that, that that change, you know, that's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's there's a word for it where they, you know, you have a, these diminishing ecosystems that, you know, and every generation adapts to the successive demise of the one created before it, a you know, shifting baseline. Mm-hmm. And, you know, is, is it just Pollyanna to say, hey, well, this is just inevitable. We're, we're, we're destined as, Human beings to oversee the de, you know the demise of the world. That's just the way it is. Or, or can you be part of this mechanism that can create a change? Is there a scientific you know reason why everybody will eventually go vegan or um, adapt to a more compassionate world? And I, I think there is. I think there is a, a there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of signals I'm getting that we can go that way. And I think films can edge us towards that eventuality. When we did that film, they were killing 23,000 dolphins and porpoises every year in Japan for human consumption. Mm -hmm. In the last year I looked, it was like two years ago, I think they killed 1,610. So it was down over like 93% since Mm -hmm. we started that film. So films are very, very powerful weapons for, for social change. And that's why I do what we're doing. We had, you know, Rickle, telling Rickleberry's story had a profound effect on that industry. They're still capturing them for the entertainment industry. And there's still, you know, there's whole countries that are, you know, have been banning it. It seems to, it goes, you know, you said it here before that it's, you know, progress is never a straight line. It's, it's messy, life is mm-hmm. messy. There's ups and downs, but you know, I, I, I'm hopeful enough about, you know, where we're going to, to feel like we can be part of the mechanism that pushes us towards a better, a better society. Yeah, I've I've heard your films described. I don't know whether this is your term or not, um, as weapons of mass instruction. Construction. <laughs> construction. Instruction, isn't it? Weapons of mass instruction. Yeah. Well, it's a destruction. Construction. Destruction. Yeah. <laughs> inst- construction. Um, which I love. It's like, how can I deploy? How can I weaponize storytelling? For a specific aim and do it in a compelling way, and and you know that's. That's sort of you know your approach to these films, and they are impactful. I mean, the Cove. I mean, certainly they're not serving dolphin meat for school lunch anymore in Japan. And I know, you know, you put your life and the life of your crew in peril to make that movie, and that was not easy. And you still can you go? You can't go back to Japan, can you? Can, can you go I, back? I, Have I you can, been I back? Can, I can go back. You I can go back? go back. I just can't get back <laughs> out. Probably. Get, um, and there was a period of time where. It was unclear whether the movie was even going to screen in Japan, right? It has since. Yeah. Well, what happened was, oh my God, I, I wish the, there was a, a famous, I think it was Spain, one of the famous Spanish directors, I believe, was doing uh, the Tokyo Film International Film Festival. Uh, Iteritu, I think and he, it was. Yeah, and he said, yeah. if uh, if you don't show the Cove, because they were doing a, a green carpet instead of a mm. green carpet, because they were trying to make it like a like a green. He says, if you don't show the Cove, I'm going to quit and there's gonna be an international protest. So I went. And so I went over to Japan with our, with, you know, our, my attorney and we get off the plane and like, I'm not talking about like in the terminal, I'm talking about on the gangway. It's like the first, like when the, you know, that, that passageway from, uh-huh. you know, the, the plane, there's presses lined there taking pictures of me getting off the plane. And they're saying, you know, asking me questions like the old people behind me, I'm thinking like, Oh, I am going to get arrested. This wow. is, gonna, you know, this is not going to be pleasant. And so we were escorted under police protection. We, you know, I walked the red carpet, but I was totally alone. 
There wasn't mm. a single person there. They Nobody cleared wanted the place to be out anywhere there. near you. No, they cleared it out. They made it so that it was going to be, mm. you know, they're going to make a point that nobody's going to see this film if if we can help it. But in, I remember at the screening, there was a lot of the people from the International Whaling Commission meeting or, uh, from Japan were there. The whalers, the, the dolphin hunters were in the back of the room. And we had a... Uh, a night vision camera in, the, in the, the theater. And I remember the previous um, head of the IWC for Japan, I think he was educated in at Yale or, or Oxford, you know, Western educated. And he was expert at crafting his rebuttal about the, the need to, you know, to, for Japan to still do whaling in, you know, defense of the, the dwindling number of whales. Mm -hmm. And I remember this when, when the, the killing scene starts in the cove. I remember looking at this guy and he, and he just, he, he's looking at the film and he just goes like this in his seat. He just goes, covers his hands, with the, his face with his hands and he's shaking it like, you know, the world just changed. There's nothing you could do. He just knew there was nothing you could yeah. say about that. It's done, you know? that guy. Um, the IWC, the International Whaling Commission, these governing bodies, the MSC, what is that? The Marine Safety Council Commission, something like that, um, are problematic. I mean, there's so much corruption. It's one thing to be boots on the ground, grassroots activism, um, you know, locality by locality, and try to you know coalesce a movement out of that through film and and you know other various means of of raising awareness. But at the t from a top-down perspective, you have these governing bodies that are just, I mean, just so patently on their face, blatantly corrupt in the scenes in the cove where we see that Japan is literally paying these failing, small developing bankrupt nations to vote you know, in lockstep with them on these measures around whaling and the dolphin trade. It's just, it's so obvious to everybody and yet, despite being out in the open continues to continues to happen and then i think there was even even more recently with the msc and and whaling in iceland etc like it's like can't we just all get behind the fact that we shouldn't be killing whales and dolphins i think we're heading that way you know iceland i think is i think they're 2025 they said it's going to be their last year doing it i mean it is happening it doesn't happen as quickly as i would want but i'm you know, if they're killing one dolphin for human consumption, that's too yeah. much. But still, when you you have to, you know, take these victories that we have and celebrate them. Because if you only focus yeah. on the negative bits, like the, you know, the three countries that are still doing it, you know. Are you able to hold on to that level of hope and optimism? I mean, the Cove came out in 2009, it's 2023. Like when you look back, how much progress has been made? What still, you know, has yet to happen that maybe you thought would have happened by now. Like when you look at, you know, that world. Yeah, I guess the, the it's the captivity trade. You would think that because that's the economic engine that drives that. They're not killing them because you know for six hundred dollars a dolphin mm -hmm. it doesn't pay for the gas. Yeah. Uh, they're they're doing it for the captive dolphin industry, and you would think that once people, you know. And over in Asia, you know, China, Japan, Middle East, if they saw, you know, I guess we need a blackfish, another, you know, another sure. film about, yeah. you know, sort of dolphin intelligence, dolphin rights. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to. Because that industry is booming in China and in the Middle East as well. I, yeah, the Middle East. I, I haven't followed it in the last couple of years. I know with the pandemic, they were failing, but now maybe it's bounced back even more. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we certainly were part of a group that got that you know we you know we got, we got things moving in the right direction on that i'm i'm on other things right now i'm i'm thinking like okay we this can work how do we use the same st storytelling chops on these other bigger issues and and scale it so that you know we can see serious progress on you know food systems mm -hmm. on health right on and that's what I'm focusing in right now. And that's that so, so sort of was like a, almost a trial balloon to, see, to show that it does work. You know, we have people working on that still in our business, but it's like, you know, the other side of it is it, it takes a lot of money to keep these doors open. You know, right. we have, 
you know, people need to get paid. And how, how do you, the, the movie didn't make a lot of money. You know, it's people, amazing. Yeah, you make this movie, The Cove, the first movie you've ever made, you win the Oscar for it and you didn't make any money. <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know, we we made enough money to pay back yeah. some of the debts that uh-huh. we had to to do it, but it's uh, you know, I I tell people that want to get involved in a documentary, the first thing I lead with is if you intend to make money off of investing in a documentary, you're better off taking your money to Vegas because uh-huh. your odds are better there. Uh, but if you want to change the world, there's no better place yeah. to come than us. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. It is it is the most effective way to provoke change i think and you know to to you know onward to your second movie racing extinction which i think is a better movie um, well, i mean you. cinematically more beautiful uh, and obviously you learned a few things about filmmaking like it's it's very compelling uh, but i don't know that it was seen as much as the cove is that true? Like that just well, there's it feels a, like it slipped question. under the radar a little bit more than the Cove. Thirty-eight million people saw it the first day. Oh wow! Yeah, it was I on didn't Discovery. Know that. Uh, Discovery, which is the biggest network in the world at that time, anyway, they had access to two and a half million, two and a half billion people. They did something unprecedented in their history. They they released it on every channel they had starting for a 24 hour period, starting in New Zealand. And you know when the sun came mm-hmm. up, they showed it all day long until it came up in California. And then um, I think 38 million people saw it those first few, two wow. days. And you know, so it had a big push, but mm-hmm. then it fell off the radar. Mm-hmm. It's like they're like they have 400 films or this, you know, became part of their content. We just got it back recently, and it's hard to. You know, to pump it back, thirty-eight million was, was a good number. If those were paying customers, yeah. oh my God, that would be like if we had ten dollars for every you know person that came through the door. You know, our focus has never been about making money. You know, it's like you know we're we run a nonprofit organization. Not that we're trying to lose people's money, but it was like I don't want to like walk into a convention and have to hide my head because there's four investors that, you know, I, I told them that you're gonna double your money or whatever. It's just not our our goal. So we try to find people that are, are mission driven and that, you know, we can focus on making a film. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the business model for making a documentary is completely broken. Now, we'll just let's say you have an average Marvel film, $100 million, probably more like $200 million. They're gonna advertise it. They have to get everybody in the theater to come on that those first weekend or two, you have to spend another hundred to two hundred million to get people to come to it. Mm-hmm. And how are you going to do that with a documentary? How can you compete? No, so it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I also think the streamers uh, have shifted focus away from documentaries, particularly hot button documentaries. I've noticed. Um, Netflix being a place originally that was this incredible home for new documentaries, birthing new filmmakers and really putting that um, mode of filmmaking like on the radar in a very mainstream way. And we saw this great success of so many documentaries in the early days of, of Netflix. But now I think the streamers are so focused on new subscribers all across the world in areas like Saudi Arabia and China that they're much more hesitant to onboard a documentary that might cause a political headache, no matter how good or high quality the documentary is. Um, I had um, Brian Fogel on, oh, who the did, uh, yeah, who did Icarus, and then when he made The Dissident, nobody would touch it. He won an Oscar for Netflix, and they were like, "We can't take this movie," you know. So things have changed, and so for someone like yourself who's ruffling feathers, who's trying to say, have difficult conversations. Um, it feels like the streaming ecosystem isn't as hospitable as it once was, which makes, you know, kind of threading the needle even more difficult. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually doing a, a, a series for Netflix right now on food. It's, it is a lot of hard issues and I've been finding that mm. it, it is working. It's been, you know, we've You've had, been working on that for a long time. It, it, Ever since, uh, yeah, probably since 2016, you know, it took, I was trying to raise the money independently, mm-hmm. went the Netflix route, and, but it's turned around in the last week, and it's like, I'm really like excited and happy that they're really going for it. They're, they're pushing it. It's I'm not, it's not complete control, but I don't know if I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, I don't wanna, 
be the only one deciding what's going to be out there. I'm a, you know, we show our, like, I, I like to, to show to audiences, you know, the, I want a lot of control to the writers, the producers, the, the editors are certainly, you know, mm -hmm. the ones, you know, driving yeah. the ship at that point and you give notes and, and the notes are coming back. And part of it, the reason I'm uh, like, I'm not confident in this process, the first time I've, it's the second time I've done a film where you, you never met you never met the the editors. Like mm. last week, I was up at everybody came to the office, the folks from Netflix and the editors. I'm meeting for the first time. I've been working on this thing for them for two years, and, yeah. and I've never met them in the flesh. And usually, I'm sitting literally every day, you know, that we're editing. I'm in the editing room with an editor, and, and now we're giving notes, and to come back in a, a week later, and you know, and the editor is the final author of the whole thing. I mean, they have incredible control over actually what it's going to be. Yeah, and they're a little, you know, they're a little bit. To be honest, they're a little bit more. You know, Netflix has final cut. And you know they're they're paying the bills, mm -hmm. you know, through us, but they're paying the bills. So they're like, you know, their allegiance is to the the streamer. And luckily, we have a a good team at Netflix. That's that's you know, I don't know if it did any good, but I did. You know, when I was in Indonesia with a really limited, you know, bandwidth a couple of weeks ago, and I just said, listen, this is not why I'm in this business. You know, we have to raise the stakes every time. I gave my you know, as, as a heart and speech as I can. Maybe it was, it, 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 I had found out later that they had already implemented those changes, but mm -hmm. I'm like in the middle of nowhere. Like literally it's like without, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm seeing this cut and it take, <laughs> it took it yeah. took me probably seven hours to watch a, a, a 45 minute cut of, a, of an episode because it just wasn't the bandwidth. I had to mm -hmm. stay up late when nobody else is using the system because we're you know, mm -hmm. with a small satellite dish and I'm, and I'm like looking at this and I'm like, oh my God, this is horrible. I'll never, you know, work in this business again. But it's just it, it. Then when I saw the final one, when I got back to stateside, it's like I didn't have to make that talk, that talk. They already yeah. they already made the changes and they're starting. It's, it's back on the rails. But boy, it's it's a different world. COVID. Everybody's working from, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they they sure. get conditioned to working from home now, and it's like nobody wants to go back to, you know, like to sit in, in an office. And that's to me, that's where a lot of the magic happens. You know, it's like in the field. You're, it's a, a great creative process. You have wonderful DPs and people that you're, you know, you're, you know, you're up there doing it, the work. And when you're not in the room with somebody, it's different. It's really different. Yeah. I can't say it's better. I, I miss it. I, I and I and who knows what? There's a lot of, I mean, there's there's a lot of the great things that happen when you're in a room with somebody and you're just having lunch and you're saying, no, what about that scene? Can we just try moving this over a little mm -hmm. bit? And then if you have to explain it to somebody or worse, explain it to like with 15 other people on a Zoom call, it's like, it's just, it's a laborious process, but it's changed. It's, it's the world that we're living in. Yeah, I feel like it's moving back though. I think that rubber band is snapping back a little bit. Um, and you're right. I mean, there's nothing there's no replacement for the energy that guy. This, I don't do. I don't do then? Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> this. I am going to shorten the table. I get a lot of criticism. We moved it long, like when COVID happened, and I still wanted to do in-person conversations, and it stayed that way. And people are like, I can't believe how long your table is. So anyway, that's a whole other thing. Um, yeah, I get it. Uh, but um, I'm glad to hear that. Is the is is Food 2.0 2 a series or is it just a documentary? It's a series. It's a series, yeah. right? Is there a, is there a, what's the premiere window for this? Be uh, January of, of this coming year. Mm. Are I'm, you allowed to talk about the subject I, matter just, that I'll you just, explore? Or we can talk generally about yeah, food just, and sustainable yeah, food just systems. Generally, I mean, you know, after the game changers, uh, we, you know, a lot of people saw that film and that, that film really, you know, first of all, I gotta say that film had an enormous, um, boost in the in the community. You know, I'm told that Merrill Lynch did a study last December, not this, but this previous one, the one before it, and they said that 75% of the worldwide interest in plant-based diet is because of that film. It's unbelievable. And it's a credit to the entire team that, that made that film. And Game Changers was incredibly impactful. It was exquisitely rendered um, and very meaningful, not just for the movement, but for, you know, really shifting people's opinions and perspectives around diet, particularly for a lot of men who get caught up in what they're eating and how that affects their athletic performance to show a very different reality in the most, you know, palpable way that really has made an incredible impact on culture, you know, to your point of, you know, weapons of mass instruction, like it was, 
extraordinary. I mean, it was really a phenomenon when that movie came out, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I, I I couldn't be happier that it made the impact that it that it has made and continues to make. I know they're. I think they just announced they're gonna. There's gonna be a second one, I guess. Right, right. And I'm not involved with it, but yeah, I'm. You know, more power to it. But you know, a lot of people came out of that movie and they said and they would tell me just anecdotally, like, oh, I I was vegan. What about now? I said, well, I did it for about three months and fell off the wagon for whatever reason. I said, why? He said, well, I'm not an athlete. And that's an extraordinary statement. Like suddenly now this is the, this is the diet only for athletes? Like that, that's quite a shift. <laughs> even though there was, a, there was a twist in that film where, you know, James's father almost dies of a heart attack. And so we, we, the, it does this whole other shift to like, hey, look, this is not only good for athletes, it's good for, you know, you know, civilians of you know of normal eating to to eat this way it's 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 a good healthful way but, the, but so so in response to that i wanted to do a film that you know it's, it's called food 2.0 now this working title will be changed to something else but um i mean the premises of, of it is fairly simple i wanted to address this idea people said oh i'm Northern European, I'm black, I'm this, I'm that. My genetics are such that I, I, I have to eat this way. So I thought, well, what if you gave identical twins, one a, he a healthy vegan diet, another one a healthy omnivore diet, and then we measured everything we possibly can, you know, from the, the usual stuff of blood pressure, cholesterol, weight, et cetera. But like, you know, get into the, Epigenetics mm -hmm. get into you know this, the, the, these new biological markers that we didn't have the tools with you know you know very well seven years ago like microbiome uh, yeah things like that yeah. yeah and so we're working with Stanford University and we have uh, identical twins where we had mm. this very are you working with the Sonnenfelds I am you are excellent yeah, yeah and cool. and uh, the Schur's eyes oh nice we're yeah, cognitive yeah, yeah. testing and to me it was like okay I don't know what the results are going to be. But, and people were, you know, my, my plant-based friends were like, well, what, what if it doesn't work in your favor? It's like, well, I'm interested in the science. I don't want, you know, I want to, I don't, I want to find out what's going on in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so the, if you take identical twins, you've taken out these variables, right? If you have, uh, it's like a, a, almost a perfect genetic test to, to, to see about the diet. Mm -hmm. So, so and then some of them were giving a, uh, an athletic physical intervention too, so that we're you know we're testing those as right. well. But and, and I mean I, I can't tell the results, but it was uh, it was fascinating. And some of the results, like the, the scientists over at Stanford, they were saying, save your money. You're not going to see any anything happen in eight weeks. It's mm -hmm. not a long enough time frame. And now I'll, I'm not going to tell you the results, but they've changed. Their parameters for studies now, based on that one study. Is uh, is Christopher Gardner involved you, in that? You got it. Yeah, right. he was here last week. Yeah, he was just here last week. <laughs> yeah, well, they kind of. I, mean, yeah. I just look at your podcast and I just invited <laughs> no. them all to be in the I'm movie. Glad I could help you recruit all the people for your big TV show. Oh, yeah. um, no, that's amazing. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. How many episodes? Four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, episode four, the, the one of the new cuts just dropped, you know, as I was flying in this morning. So I'm really excited to see it because that's like, you know, at the end of the day, I want people to to look seriously at what they're putting in their mouths. There's, there's no other thing in the world that we can do to give us agency over the environment, over personal health, over the, the welfare of other creatures mm -hmm. than what you put in your mouth. To me, it's just like a, it's a no brainer, but... But how do you make that entertaining to people? It's like, you know, that's tough. Yeah. You know, you don't want it to look like, you know, a vegan propaganda. Yeah. But, you know, I'm 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 thrilled with the the process so far that, you know, we were really you know, I was sweating bullets for about, you know, I'd say almost two years thinking, well, what if this you know, this doesn't look good for, you know, our yeah, I've heard you've been talking about this for a long time and I was interested in what the status of it is. Well, I'll tell so. you offline later. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. Um, you know, t you mentioned, you know, how difficult it is to, you know, co sort of craft these these challenging ideas around something that's entertaining and palatable. Um, and it made me think of, of the recent, 
uh, Apple TV Plus uh, series extrapolations. Did you have you I watched that? I didn't see it. I don't know about it. what is it. It's it's this limited series that tackles climate change by casting its gaze into the future, and every episode mm-hmm. is like ten years later. As like you know, this graph of of carbon emissions continues to go up, and you kind of see the world the way that it would appear during that period of time. And each episode is sort of a standalone thing. A lot of talented people worked on this show. It looks like it was very expensive and the intentions are nothing but you know extraordinary. But to me, it ends up not really connecting uh, because it's, it's trying to be this important thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it is, and I've watched it and I got a lot out of it, but I think there's a reason why, you know, someone like yourself hasn't seen it or or maybe a larger audience hasn't seen it because it's missing that that piece around um, really connecting with an audience in a in a very visceral emotional way i tell other you know you know i'd say young directors that you know you have a choice so would, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective cuz you know we're all indignant about the way that we think the world should be but is that going to connect? Is that going to work? You know, is there uh, what's what's the audience that doesn't think the way that you think going to? How are they going to connect with this? Are they going to see it as propaganda? Are they going to think of it as like is it entertaining? You know, Michael Moore, you know, he said the first rule of filmmaking is don't be boring. And you could say, oh well, there's nothing more important than saving the world. But like, okay, well, you know, I'm very cognizant that you know you work. Everybody works. I'm assuming pretty hard. They're you know they're they're tired. They they get back from work and there's a, it's like they have a choice. What do you want to watch on television? Do you want to watch the new Marvel Star Wars thing? Which by the way I will watch too. But like you know what's gonna what's gonna make them click? You know so there's a word of mouth that there's a scene in there that um, you know you got to see. You know that and and that's what I'm that's what I think we do well. Mm-hmm. I think I think visually I'm tr- I'm always like putting way too much energy but it's valuable energy into like, how do you make this scene, give them something that they haven't seen before at the Cove, we we put time-lapse market, you know, time-lapse cameras in the market at Skiji. And, you know, it took us a month to, we had to get permission from all five of the, the major brands that controlled that, plus Mitsubishi, which oversaw everything. So there's a lot of negotiating back and forth right. that happened to get those, that one minute scene in there. But it's still probably one of the best scenes about overfishing that I've ever seen, because it shows like this. You see the the gates open up, you know the, and then you see the the light come in, the mm-hmm. tuna get out there. You see the smoke rise from the the frozen fish. The the buyers come in and they they take them off and put them on the trucks. It goes dark. It happens the next day. You see this wave after wave of like, oh my god, these are giant bluefin tuna that are now endangered, and they're just it's just a commodity. And you know, it's just something that's visceral. Yeah, it's not. You could say that, but when you see it, it does something else. It clicks. You know, um, so, uh, uh, some writers can do that with humor. Um, Mark Twain talked about the the Philippine War back in I think the you know the turn of his century, the nineteen hundreds, and you know it's all the atrocities of war that we thought about of Vietnam. But he's making us kind of laugh at ourselves. At our imperialistic nature, mm-hmm. he's, he's, there's a, there's a way that you can communicate that where people can see themselves. He did it through humor. I do it through a visual language with the words and the music, and you know, with the, obviously with a big team of very talented people, more talented than me. But I'm the head bogus loony that r- r- wrangles them all together so that we're all, you know, a, on a mission. And then we, we get us all in the, in the room. We're we're thinking like, is this? I'm always thinking like, do we need those two frames? Can we make this a little bit short? I'm feel I'm feeling like the, the 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 audience a little bit hesitating. Can we just make it speed up a little bit? Mm-hmm. Can we? And if you don't have those assets in the field, you're not going to create them in the editing room. And our writer Mark Monroe has written four of the films I've done. I said I said we have the opposite problem that every other filmmaker has. We have too much good stuff. We have to kill a lot of our babies. They say, you know, stuff that we love that we really worked hard to. But I'd rather have gone in the field and gotten those asset, assets and gotten those stories so that when we, we're, we're in the editing room, we're surrounded by a whole palette of, of beautiful scenes that we can put together to orchestrate to, so we can 
dial in that those emotional moments so that we can find those hooks that'll get people, you know, hopefully going from one episode to the next. And that's exciting to me. It's like, you know, but you got to be doing it in the field. Mm -hmm. You have to be doing it from the creation. You're not going to be like, you're not going to find a, you know, a masterpiece, you know. In the edit if you didn't shoot it. Right. Or you didn't think about it. Yeah, in in Racing Extinction, it's getting the Tesla and kitting it out James Bond style with your team of wizards who are like, you know, this Q who are like, you know, creating all these, you know, add-ons to that car to allow you to project onto buildings and, you know, onto clouds and all the like that becomes this, you know, massive, uh, you know, kind of inflection point for popular awareness. Yeah, and it was, it was a, the car was like a, a, a transitional character to get us to the big projections. And let me explain that a little bit. Like, you know, with the, the people who haven't seen the film, we took a, a, a model S, one of the early editions, like you said, and made it into like a, a bond car for the environment. It's the first car in the world to have an electroluminescent paint job. We could change the color of the car with a flick of a button, never been done before. We had a um, forward looking infrared camera, FLIR camera that came out of the front on a robotic arm so we could see the invisible world of greenhouse gases. Out of the back, out of the hatch, we had a 20,000 lumen IMAX projector so we could project those images onto skyscrapers or mountaintops. We had disappearing license plates, that whole, that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, it was, a, it was a great hook for that. But what we were interested in doing is the whole premise of that, you know, it started here actually in LA where at the beginning of the movie, Adi Gill, does these projections? Right. He, you know, he, he was at the sushi restaurant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, at the at the you know the, the Oscars and the Emmys, it would be his screens that they would rent. You know, the, the like high end screens to you know for the, the the award ceremonies. And he put one of those. He, he had the business that rented those out to those places. So he had a screen that he put out in front of the Hump Restaurant, which was illegally selling whale meat. We had bust our team. Uh, busted that restaurant essentially, mm-hmm. you know, and this is right during the Oscars for the code too. It was like, I remember those. Oh, fl- I didn't know that those those time periods overlap. Oh my like god, that. it was it was so funny. Because, I didn't even know the hump was in L.A. Oh yeah, it's at uh, the, it was at the um, Santa Monica Airport. They were selling all kinds of endangered, illegal fish whale, in their sushi. Whale meat. Whale meat. Whale meat. Yeah. Say whales. That was the third largest whale in the world. So uh, we had heard about it. It became like this sort of urban legend, and. Um, we sent a couple of operatives into the restaurant, you know, it's two weeks. We were pretty, because uh, the the Cove was out in theaters. We hadn't yet won the Oscar, and but we were doing a lot of press around town and stuff. And, you know, so we were kind of, I want to say many people would say, oh, you were the person from the movie about mm-hmm. us. We didn't want to go in the sushi restaurant. So Heather Rowley and this other woman, Crystal Galbraith, they went in um, and we gave them like, you know, some of the last money that we had to, um, to, to do, they would order a lot of expensive sake and, you know, ingratiate yourself to the waiters and order, you know, the whale meat. And we were listening in the back of, the, of a car, you know, the, these transmissions going on when they ordered it. So when we got the, the, the story is, when we, we got this with this whale meat, we had the, the samples and then we went to, God, I can't remember which agency it was. It was like Fish and Wildlife. There's a couple different agencies that were dealing with this. And I, we took up took the samples up to Monterey, to Fish and Wildlife. I think it was Fish and Wildlife. And they said, well, that's all fine and good, but you need a chain of custody. I said, what's that? And they said, well, we don't know that, you know, mm. one of our people wasn't overseeing the sample. Uh, it's say well. We had to analyze the say well, but you could have just planted it. So it'd be your word against them. And they said, can you do a, you know, come with us on a bust, you know, or get them to, you know, those mm. the same women. And we'd run out of money. Mm. And they went and tried to do a sting themselves, but they couldn't get the restaurant to sell them the meat. Uh, and so then when we were in LA for the for the Oscar roundup, um, we were getting a commendation from the, 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 the mayor's office, you know, some some award here in town. And I, rem- I remember looking at it and said like, we got our, we got our team here. We can go to, we can, we can do this. We can do this thing. This, yeah. is, like, this is like, like two days before the Oscar. And there was actually uh, a party that night for at the mayor's mansion or wherever the mayor hangs out. And I remember like my, my wife at the time, she had like a, you know, we had a, a, a you know, the distributor had like a limo and we we're, you know, it was a mm-hmm. big, you know, dolled up event. Right. And I said, well, you go ahead without me. I'm going to go do this thing. And she, I remember she, I love her, but she said, why don't you grow up? 
<laughs> and I thought, well, this is what I, I was meant to do. So, <laughs> who do you think I'm married to? <laughs> uh, bless her heart. You know, it, it, I can see it uh, like it was, a, you know, this was like a, the one, you know, one night that we could have to. Sure. to can't, you so, can't take a day off to go to the Oscars. <laughs> like, you know, you go so on we, this sting. So, so this right. is, I can't remember, the Oscars are on a Sunday night. We did this like on a Friday night or a Saturday night. And we had these three agencies, uh, agents at the bar, at the sushi bar. Mm-hmm. Our women went in with their, you know, the, the, the same women, two women, Heather and Crystal went in and they, they did the buy. And then, um, and then I remember we, we won the Oscar on, on, Sunday night on Monday morning, it's like front page news that you know oh. we busted the hump restaurant. So it all happened right at the same That's time. It was crazy. like this perfect story. And it wasn't just, you know, the, the agency. Now here's what was going on. We had a, I had a friend who was working at the, uh, the, the US uh, IWC, the International Whaling Commission meeting. And he said that at the time, this might be complicated, but Obama, who we all love, was making a backroom deal with the Japanese to give them open up um, commercial whaling in order to keep the the bases open in Okinawa. That was mm. the, the rhetoric I heard. And I thought, we have to press this because this deal's about to happen. So I want, you know, if it became front page news that whale meat is being sold right here in America, we could shut down those talks. Yeah, it and would so, just, that would become radioactive for Obama. So that's why yeah. we did, we, we jumped the gun. So like we didn't wait for the uh, fish and wildlife and, and the US customs to go through you know, what, what they had to do to do a, a proper bust. We just announced it and that was, you know, that was it. And they were, they were pissed off at us. But like, to me, it wasn't about like them getting accolades for doing the bust. It was about trying to shut down this idea of opening up commercial whaling again. Mm. That was the reason for it. But that all happened at the, about the same time. It was a, yeah, that's wild, the compression of, of time on that. It's so wild to think about the fact that whaling still exists and that people are hunting and killing dolphins, these, you know, magical, extraordinary, incredibly, uh, you know, intelligent animals. And if there was one thing in that extrapolation series that that kind of stuck with me, there is a sequence in which, you know, the oceans are completely acidified and the whales, I think there's like, you know, maybe one or two whales left, but they have cracked the code in in uh, in deciphering the language, like they've they've got the technology to do that. So there's a sequence where somebody is you know is in a like in an underwater. There's a station and part of it's underwater, and they're you know communicating with this with this whale. And it made me think about the potential with AI and how quickly it's advancing right now yeah. in our capacity to figure out. Uh, the nuances of how dolphins and whales, you know, and 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 other, you know, other of these cetaceans, you know, are are communicating in a way that you know maybe we could figure out. Yeah, it was interesting. Like I mentioned, Roger Payne. He's the he's the guy that discovered that humpback whales are singing. So back in the I think it was the seventies, he wrote a paper, and you know, whales use rhyme. They have meter. They have, but they don't have a. What they don't have is a start and a and a finish. They have it's a river of song. Like they'll have an eighteen minute song, but they don't say okay <gasps> and then start again. They'll keep on singing. So th- th- this was novel uh, back in the nineteen seventies. And National Geographic came out with a record called "Songs of the Humpback Whale." It's still the, the largest single pressing of a musical recording ever done. Bigger than the Beatles. Bigger than Elvis. Bigger than Taylor Swift. Don't hold me to that, but it was anyway. And uh, that is what sparked the Save the Whale movement, and that created that helped create the, the moratorium for whaling. And Roger just died on Saturday, mm. and so he knew he was going to die. And so I called him up on Thursday, the last day before his full day alive on the planet, and just told him what he meant to us. You know how he how he moved things forward, and how much I loved him when I had when I was working on the cove. And Jim had Athena. He, he gave me that boat to use for uh, one of some of our first expeditions. And we went down to Silver Banks, which is where 80% of the North Atlantic humpback whales come to mate and give birth and to, you know, socialize these five distinct pods from the Northern Atlantic come all down to the Silver Banks, about you know, 70 miles north of the Dominican Republic. And he, Jim said, who do you want to invite? And my first guest was Roger Payne. Mm. So a couple of friends of mine have their, something called their Earth Species Project where they're using AI 
to try to decipher language and said, you got to meet Roger Payne. He's the guy that started it all. And his wife, Katie Payne, was actually the one who first figured it out and then he wrote it up and you know they, they worked it out together, but it was really Katie. And Katie, by the way, um, his, his ex-wife is the one that discovered that not only uh, it, whales use, you know, the, the, are, are singing, he, she's also one that discovered that elephants use infrasound uh, sound below our level of of hearing to communicate. Now, though, though, this is Whoa. this is fascinating. I didn't, what, even, I didn't know. What, okay, so get, get this. Yeah. So Roger was amazing. I spent a week with him on this boat. You know, an amazing boat. But the the whole he would put these hydrophones in the water as we were eating at this really fine boat. You know, three masted schooner out in the middle of the water, and he and and anywhere you put now, imagine there's thousands of whales there. It's only the males that sing. And they, they're singing, you know, to probably the same way that, you know, we sing, you know, to find mates, to, you know, get your tribe together. And you can hear these strange ethereal songs as you're, as we're having dinner and they're, they're right below us. There's like this alien universe singing right below the boat. And, you know, he would, he would tell us about like blue whales, blue whales, you know, most of their song happens below our level of singing. Like when I'm talking right now, if you saw it on an oscilloscope, it'd be like these little quick waves, right? My voice going up and down each, each note. But the blue whales operate on a different metronome than you and I do. If you saw their song it, uh, through, a, through a computer screen, it looked like a straight line, but that straight line was really one of those squiggles, but it's like a kilometer mm. long because their notes, when the single note is like a, a kilometer long. Wow. So, right. it, but you, so but you, have if to you, comp- you have to speed it up and compress it. You, sp- you speed yeah. it up and it sounds like birdsong. And uh, because it's low infrasound, they use something called the deep ocean channel where the, the, the colder water at the bottom, these waves propagate at the bottom, they bounce off the surface and they can actually go on for thousands of miles. So these whales can communicate thousands of miles. One of um, so one of the pro- the proteges of, of Roger Payne was this guy Chris Clark who was in Racing Extinction, and he was brought in. SOSIS is uh, the underwater surveillance system that the Navy uses to detect submarines, and they they started opening it up to scientists, and they brought Chris in to try to figure out what this this one uh, what they call biological was doing, and he. he you know, because at first they thought it was a submarine, like a Russian sub. It would go off in one direction. It was using the same frequency to ping that the submarines do. And it would go, it would be noisy for like six or seven minutes, then it would stop. And then it would be in a different direction. And he goes, well, that's not a submarine. That's a fin whale and it's feeding. Wow. <laughs> and they, they did, he, he realized that uh, SOSIS is this underwater string of hydrophones that the Navy strung along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you know, roughly halfway between, you know, um, the Eastern coast of America and Europe. And that's to detect, you know, boats. See, every mm. submarine and boat has a different signature and they could, you know, they had somehow, uh, they would, put on these filters to take out the biologicals and somehow this whale had, you know, developed a song. So it was sing at the, singing at the same frequency as the, sub, the subs were there. So anyway, he, he, he realized, Chris had realized that, you know, they had this filter on and that if they took the filter off, he could see where a song was coming from all over the Atlantic Ocean. So they had him turn, he asked him to turn it off. And now the way he describes it, it was a secret bunker off in Norfolk or someplace over one of these bases. And it was like a basketball court size area with people with three screens. Remember, this is like in the early '90s where nobody had more than two screens, right. and there's you know dozens of people with headphones all listening for Russian submarines. Now, Chris asked them on this big screen to turn off, you know, off the filter to filter out the biologicals. He said it lit up like a Christmas tree for a few for a few seconds, then it blew the computers. <laughs> <laughs> he said the whole, he realized that the whole ocean is full of song. That you know, whatever you know, wherever he put, where you go, mm. you go to the Arctic and everywhere you put in a hydrophone, you hear cetaceans somewhere singing close by or far away. Because it actually, it's, it's oxymoronic, but animals can uh, the sound travels about four and a half to five times quicker underwater than it does on land. So, the, you know, and if you see these low waves, low frequency waves, you can transfer. You can see, you know, you they'll travel these, those great distances, like thousands of miles. In fact. Roger Payne thinks that these that blue whales evolved so they could actually hear themselves clear around the world in the deepest, at the longest part, like the Southern Ocean, where there's no land mass. They can actually hear, you know, trans, they can ostensibly hear themselves over nine thousand miles. A blue whale. 
That's insane. It is. Well, anyway. That's crazy. And I mean, just just to know that completely changes your lens on like how you think of an animal like that. Oh, there's a, when we had Roger on the boat, I'm trying to remember the story. Okay, one of, there's a researcher. This is, this was, this I think would be, you know, what we're talking about is like a Rosetta Stone, right? It's like, so like AI is like a Rosetta mm. Stone where you had you know, like the ancient Greek and then you had the um, Egyptian hieroglyphs, right? I think that, wasn't that what was going on? They had the, basically, a, it was a ledger, it was basically in ancient Greek and the hieroglyphs. And it was a way that they could figure out, okay, triangulate, like what does this symbol mean to this word that we do know? I see. So that's, that was like a key. Now, AI says, okay, we don't need to know anything about language, we'll just use these models that and somehow figure out what these animals are saying based on, you know, this this very complex algorithm that we don't even know. But this one of the researchers I had in the boat with Roger, he put hydrophones in the water. This is a guy, Lou Herman, Herman from Hawaii. He was teaching dolphins tricks, two pairs of dolphins tricks. And you can you put your fingers together and go together. And then he you do like a a, a circular gesture, do a flip. And dolphins, I'm told, will readily get this. They'll, they'll do that nearly instantaneously to get, put fingers together, fl- you know, flip your fingers in a circle, and the dolphins will swim to the bottom of the tank, come back up, they'll do a flip, and they'll get the reward. And then, you know, they would do this so well, he'd be like, okay, what if we said together, and he'd put, go like his hands spread apart, you know, like, like your mind said, be creative. So together, be creative. He said, now they put a hydrophone in the water, but it was only one hydrophone. So they, they don't know what's being said. But the, the, the dolphins instantly went down to the bottom tank, did a, a, a flip, went back in the water, then they spit out water inst- at the same time into the face of the, the researcher. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean- So they so, hatched a plot, basically. Yeah. And they but, agreed upon that But But plan. somewhere in there, in that language, in my mind would yeah. be like is, spit water at the researcher in his face. <laughs> you know what I mean? You could have de- deciphered it. So uh-huh. I, mean, I would say use AI in a situation where you know what's going on rather than- Right, to reverse engineer like what was communicated and understood. Yeah, so like what, what they're doing right now, these friends of mine I put in touch with Roger Payne is they, they're looking at, they're taking all the data from Cornell University or I think Scripps, with people where they have these hydrophones out in the water working right now and they're trying to, use AI to decipher what, what these animals are saying, but they they run into what's called the cocktail problem. Like if this studio was full of uh, dozens of people and then you're trying to isolate what mm. people are saying, it's called the cocktail problem. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. about if you just have two animals in a room and you have a hydrophone in each one of them so you know what what's being communicated? Mm-hmm. That to me is like, but you know, that's why I'm a you know filmmaker, not a researcher. Right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I would imagine that at some point they're gonna figure it out. Like these tools are so powerful. Um, it, it feels like it's only a matter of time before the technology advances enough and the, the science progresses where they're gonna figure this out. Yeah, imagine. And that could be like a watershed moment in how we relate to you know, this underwater kingdom that is so poorly misunderstood and we you know, treat like the world's garbage can. Yeah, I would imagine what, you know, if we could, well, first of all, you know, a lot of dolphin species and whale species have bigger brains than us and they have more- The dolphin brain is insane. Yeah, and they have more, you know, convolutions of the gray matter. So there's more opportunities for, you know, synapses for more, you know, they have spindle neurons that are more spindle neurons that are associated with uh, processing complex emotions. They got a lot going on up there, but, you know, we as, humans, you know, we keep on changing the bar and say, well, they don't use tools. Well, you know, in fact, crows, ch- you know, chimps and a lot of other animals do use tools. But, you know, we keep on saying, you know, but they don't have computers, but they don't have podcasts. You know, it's like we're never analyzing or va- valuing an animal for how well it survives in its environment. Mm-hmm. And you look at like, okay, so we have these big brains. And sometimes you can, you know, intelligence could be how well does a species work within the confines or the the barriers of their own ecosystem? Or do they try to impinge that? You know, if you eat all, you know, if you consume all the resources, is that intelligence? <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> we're failing pretty miserably when it comes to that metric. Yeah, I think so. They're perfectly adapted to their environment. It's because they don't 
um, unlike humans, they're not they're not crafting their environment. They're not changing their environment. Yeah, I, there's a. I mean, there's obviously there's been a lot of, you know, development over the last four and a half billion years of human history. But I was talking to one scientist, and he said, "Well, you know, the Earth is going to be fine without us." And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, let's, you know, the, the earth is always changing. You know, the advent of blue-green algae created a- oxygen and it gave us us. And a lot, there's a lot of winners and losers when oxygen became, you know, one of the, you know, the, the, the chemicals in the atmosphere. And I said to him, but blue-green algae didn't have a choice. You know, we're at the cusp of what they call the Anthropocene, you know, the sixth ma- major extinction in the, in the, the you know, on the planet, there's been five of them all caused by, mm-hmm. you know, either geologic or meteorological, you know, issues, asteroids. And those are all events that, you know, one species wasn't in control of, but we we have a choice, unlike, you know, a wild animal. And that's what maybe is different about us. And the, 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 to me, the, the question becomes, how quick can we all figure that out so that we're making choices that are, you know, good for the environment? You know, and and so how do you think about solutions with this idea? You know, humankind is the asteroid in this equation, in this you know mass species extinction event. That's act one. And there's one. no what's that? That's act one. Yeah, that's okay. So we're in act one. Um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to have to experience the bottom of act two, where everything feels hopeless, and somehow at the last minute we figure out how to solve this problem. We have solutions to pretty much all of these problems. It's the implementation of these solutions. It's, you know, activating, you know, a base of enough people to be adopters of these solutions. And then it's the top down, you know, political will conversation around getting everybody corralled into, you know, one mindset around solving this problem. Well, or these, this series of problems. There's some really good evidence and science that shows that Social change happens when you have ten percent of the population one hundred percent committed to the truth, and that's you know that's you look that's what happened with electric cars. That's what happened with with cell phones. That's what happened you know the the suffragette movement. That's what happened with the civil rights movement. And then, like we said earlier, that's when you get to thirty percent. That's when people are doing it just because it's been normalized. I think that tr- trying to get this these movements up to the ten percent so that it's unstoppable is part of my job. And that's one reason, by the way, we do the projection events. You know, when, you know, films like, you know, the films that we, let's say Racing Extinction, 38 million people, the first weekend, the first night, that's great, but that's not 700 million people, which is, you know, or 800 million people, mm-hmm. which is 10% of the population of the planet. That's why we do the projection events. With the projection events, we found and I, and I knew this at the point from Lalani Munter. She said, she's the one that, you know, showed me these first studies. And I, I, I read the study and I called up the lead researcher because there was three pages of algorithms, some math that I just didn't understand. I, it was never in my strong suit. And I said to him, can you give this to me in lay language? What this means, what this paper means? Because I understand what 10% of the population means, 100%, but I don't, you know, understand the, the why of all this math. He said, well, it's like if you're trying to create steam, it'll never happen unless you get water up to a boiling point. He said 10% of the population, 100% committed, is the boiling point for the exchange of social ideas. And that I can understand. It's like, okay, if, but how do you reach seven or 800 million people? With the projection events, we can do it. When we, when we did Racing Extinction, we showed it at Sundance. We, at that point, we had, we had only projected on the United Nations and it looked good, it looked beautiful. Um, you know, the, the front of the UN, by the way, this was done with permission with the UN, with Ban Ki-moon, who was working on the uh, 2014, this was the preamble to the uh, the Paris Accords. Mm-hmm. And uh, it looked good, but the, the New York police said they would shut us down if we had over 2,000 people attend because they were worried about 600,000 mm-hmm. activists in town and them storming in the gates, whatever fantasy they had in their heads. So it never had that kind of momentum that, that I wanted. What I'd always wanted to do was to project on the Empire State Building because I thought that was like, you know, to me, there's something symbolic about it. The UN's great, but if without a crowd, it didn't, it was never going to resonate. And remember Discovery at that point, you know, they paid us all the money they were going to give us. It was going to cost like, you know, one and a half million dollars to do a projection event. 
And they said, the film's good enough. Don't worry about it. And I thought, well, we need to get a, a lot of people to see it. Otherwise, it'll just be like, it'll just be another good movie. You know, that wasn't my objective. How do you change things? So um, they said, well, if, a, a projection event in August in New York said all the important people are going to be in the Hamptons. They're going to be over in, you right. know, over in Europe. It'll be a non-event. It'll be, it gets dark late in New York. and not, uh, So the press won't be there. They can't afford to pay overtime. It'll be a non-event. And so we did it. I raised the money. We did the event. And I remember we had rented out a bar uh, overlooking the Empire State Building. And my son came up for it and he goes, Dad, there's people in the streets. And I thought he meant people in the streets waiting to get into the, the bar because it was, it was packed. And he, he goes, no, no, look over the side of the building. And we looked over in like Fifth Avenue with all these projections going off endangered species on the Empire State Building. It was like the, the, New, the New York Easter Parade. It wow. was just like, you know, packed, you know, like traffic was, you know, was halted. So I went down to take a look and, you know, they, they couldn't hear the music. They didn't know what was going on up there. They just saw something extraordinary and they mm -hmm. all had phones. They all had, you know, everybody became a photographer. And um, we had some media show up, but like the cops said, hey, if this gets too crazy, we're gonna have to shut it down. But we, it took me four years to get permission from the city to do those projections. And we had 939 million media views by Thursday. It was the top trending story on Facebook and Twitter for four days worldwide. Wow. And we thought, you know, it was on the cover of like, you know, the New York Times. It was, you know, all the, the media, everybody picked up on it and everybody had a cell phone and then it got shared a sure. lot. We did. So yeah, billions and billions of eyeballs on Yeah, us. and then so yeah. we, uh, we thought we couldn't get any more attention to the subject than that of endangered species, you know, in the Anthropocene. And then the Pope calls. <laughs> and and the, the Pope wanted us to project on the Vatican for his Laudato Si, this was in December. Mm -hmm why world leaders were meeting in Paris to talk about the accords, you know, because remember Pope Francis is named after St. Francis, mm -hmm. the patron saint of animals. Animals, yeah. So we did a, a projection event there and it was so surreal because we're think, like, we we didn't meet with the Pope, but we met with his number two over at the Vatican this previous, you know, when we, we get the job to go do it. And he goes to me, I'm not gonna be able to repeat his, his accent, but he goes, if it was up to me, I, this wouldn't happen. And I said, why? And he says, well, because the last artist to do anything on the Vatican was Michelangelo. <laughs> 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 and so we had, there were 600 yeah. media there. We had, you know, that whole square leading up to the, you know, the Vatican was filled. I think mm. 225,000 people saw it live. Uh, we had 4.4 billion media impressions just in the English language. And, uh, you know, it, it, at least in America, those projections help create laws that prevent some of the most endangered species from being trafficked on, you know, through U.S. ports, which was, there was a loophole yeah, that they were yeah, getting yeah. through. So that, and, and to me, like, we have another uh, projection event that we're, we'll find out what's going to happen tomorrow, but um, we're working on with the Empire State Building again and the city of New York who now wants us to come mm -hmm. back. And we want it to be all like three nights projection, one on food, one on solutions to climate change. And we know that we've reached nearly a billion people before with a three day night, with a three night projection, we, we'll be able to build on that. So for me, this is a way to scale change. It, it, like a movie is great, it's, it's powerful, but a projection event is a way to cut through all the, the media hype. You don't have to pay for this either. Yeah. Instead of like, you know, getting, you know, paying for advertising, you're getting people that wanna share it. That that's kind of the It's super powerful. And the artistry that goes into these projections, like I don't know how you find these artists to kind of craft these displays, but they're they're really exquisite. Oh thanks. Thanks. So it is, you know, it yeah. is, you know, we've got a lot of I mean, they should be going they should be I mean, talk about scaling social change. I mean, you could just have projection events going on all over the world all the time. That's the idea, because everybody has what we've learned about projections, like you can pull up to, I don't know, a building in LA that's kind of dark and project on it, but like, so what? You know what I mean? The, the, there's, there has to be some sort of symbolic meaning, uh, meaning behind it. So if, when you project on the United Nations, it's like, this is the mm -hmm. one building that represents the world coming together mm -hmm. to look at big existential problems and solutions. The Empire State Building represents the pinnacle of, you know, city life and progress and, you know, capitalism and then when you put animals on it it sort of vibrates against that what that means you know what i mean you're saying this is important too this is nature 
you don't see it in the city and now you're seeing it. And the kids are like, they didn't know what these animals were. They'd never seen them before. And you forget that. If you live in a city, your exposure to nature is really limited by like what you see on TV or maybe up in the Adirondacks or something, but you don't get to see like, you know, a, a golden lion tamarind or, a, you know, any of these creatures. So they all look like alien creatures. So, right. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, legacy, how you think about, you know, the meaning that you're, that you're leaving behind, et cetera. Uh, but I want to do that first. I want to preface that by, asking you a little bit about this um, project that you did uh, around joy with Desmond Tutu mm-hmm. and, and, the, and the Dalai Lama. I have not yet seen that, that film, um, but I did read the book and, and Doug Abrams is a very good friend of mine. We went to college together and he's been on the podcast twice. <laughs> so, I mean, Doug and I, I've known Doug since I was 18. Really? Yeah. Oh, so how did you good. get involved with that? And talk to me a little bit about that and, and also how it's kind of, Maybe changed. Maybe it hasn't changed, but I, I I would venture to imagine that it probably has kind of changed how you think about you know your work and your life. Yeah, everything really. I mean, I was at a I was down in San Jose where Doug lives, and I was at a dinner with a lot of other people, and uh, sitting a, a room full of really interesting people. And then uh, halfway through, the host said, "Oh, now to mix it up, switch with other people on the other side of the room." I found myself sitting next to Doug. Mm. And I said, I didn't know him. I didn't go to school with him. I said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm a, I'm a, a book publisher. I said, well, anything I would have heard of. He said, well, I'm probably best known for the book of joy. I said, I love that book. That's amazing. He said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a filmmaker. You know, what have you done? I said, oh, the, the Cove. And I don't know if he even heard of it. And he, then he, he mentioned that they had documented that meeting between Desmond Tutu and and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And he said, said well, we have like, eight, like 18 hours of footage over a four and a half day period. Do you think it could be made into a film? I said, well, let's take a look at it. And so I saw it in the raw form mm. and I found myself as I was watching it, like having all these light bulb moments in my head about joy, like what, you know, really figuring, I know this podcast is full of now a lot of great t- people talking about what gives you joy, but what really resonated for me was like, yeah, of course, that's why I feel good when I do something that's not just for myself, when it's for others, it's, it does feel good. It's what they call, you know, like a, a wise selfish, you know, when you're doing something good for you, it also feels good for me and that's okay. It's like fully selfish is when you're doing it only to get something out of somebody because mm-hmm. it's a transactional or it's like a, it's one-sided. And that did make me feel like, God, I wish I would have, seen that that a film like that like you know when i was in my 20s and so this is before the pandemic and with i said yeah i think we can you know cut footage you know we'll have to go back and you know re-engineer some of the stuff and you know film scenes with the dalai lama and desmond tutu and then the you know COVID hit and now all of a sudden we're trying to make a film like where you're afraid to go out of the country or you can't get into the country and like I mentioned before, like, you know, I made that film with people who I'd never even met physically. I met Doug because he was mm-hmm. right down the, you know, down the street, so to speak, you know, in California. But that film was like uh, so important to me. You know, in my head, like you can't change society unless they f- you figure out a way that you can communicate with them. Like you can, you can understand people and what does give them joy. And to me, that film was like a, I'd call it like chiropractic for the soul. You know, just everything snapped into place for me. Like, okay, this is, you know, how do you take, you know, one of the big takeaways from the, that film to me was like, you have these two spiritual leaders, two of the greatest spiritual leaders in the world, probably at that point, at this point still. How do, how do you, you know, what do they have in common? You know, the Dalai Lama's thousand room palace, you know, with, you know, servants and, mm-hmm. you know, could lead an army and you have Desmond Tutu born in the squalors of, you know, the slums of South Africa. But they both learned that out of this kind of grief is probably only possible to to get really great joy. You know, you have to, take a hardship and turn it like what's how can you turn this around what's where's the silver lining in it because there's always a way to reframe it you know it's kind of a classic 
Buddhist thing is reframing, you know, instead of what was me, like, okay, how do you turn that negative bit? I mean, like, look at your own journey, you know, you took, you know, being overweight and alcoholic and doing drugs into, you know, one of the most popular podcasts in the world, you know, it's a, with, without that, you probably wouldn't be here. No. Yeah. No, there's no question about it. Um, but finding that way to, um, you know, channel that pain um, to, you know, first of all, heal yourself, but then uh, figuring out a way to, to, to give it back or to, you know, be of service um, and tying that, you know, somehow to things that you care about or problems that are greater than you in the world is to my mind, like the Holy Grail. Like if you can find something that you love, uh, that's also meaningful for other people and is solution-based for some of the problems that we face as individuals and as a collective, there's nothing more fulfilling in my life. And certainly, you know, you're, you're living your life in that, in that manner. Yeah, I think, I mean, but the takeaway from from all that was like God. There's like there's, the there's joy, a lot of the, the what, joy. If, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's it. That, that that's the the joy that when you think about the moments that really give you joy, that like lasting joy, mm -hmm. and they talk a lot about that in the film is like, you know, what kind of joy are we talking about? And so, you know, it's not like a permanent state of utopia. It's just those hits that you have when you're on the right path, when you are giving back, when you are in service to the universe rather than just yourself. Um, and then if you can just align yourself with this, you know, you know, only bringing the people in that you want to talk to mm -hmm. or just, yeah. you know, narrowing in on the focus of like, what, what, we all have a limited amount of time on this planet and like how you decide to use those and who you decide to, to share them with is probably the biggest decision that we can make. Right. You know, and, um, and and making that your north star, my, making that my north star has certainly given me the the more fulfillment that I ever knew was possible. In fact, that's why Jim Clark, I say, has made me the richest person mm. in the world because mm. he did give me the opportunity to do to find that north star that I don't think I would have had without him. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, I think on top of that, the joy provides a more sustainable fuel source to to kind of pursue what it is that you care about long-term. And I think what you see in the activist community in particular is, is you know, a very short-term uh, fuel source based on, you know, being upset with the state of the world and feeling like any self-care or experience of joy would be an indulgence because it's so dire and it requires all of your attention. And as a result, a lot of people burn out or they just can't, they can't maintain that level of intensity in the work that they're, that they're doing. Um, but to kind of disabuse people of the idea that, that you know, it's okay to experience joy in the midst of all of this. And in fact, if you can do that, it, it sets you up to be an even better servant in the short term and gives you the ability to serve long-term. Well said. It's hard though. Yeah. Sorry, well, no. I mean, I think if you're on the path, though, I mean, you 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 know when you can when you you do have you're pointed towards that north star and you start to veer off, you know it. Yeah. You know you you you. I know veer off you, a lot. Yeah. I'm a grouchy, resentful. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I gotta let you go, but like you got you have a lot of stuff you're working on, right? So you have this food 2.0 show on Netflix that's coming up. We talked about. Um, but you also have uh, this um, she change project with the with the female big wave surfers, right? Which sounds pretty cool. It's like a, what's it's a the, great one for kick ass yeah. women surfers. They got pay parity in the sport of you know male dominated sport of big mm -hmm. wave surfing. Yeah, that's a great film. It's hard, you know, for some reason it's hard to get funded too. I mean, we're still struggling for that last million, but I think it's such a great film. It's not just about surfing, it's about women's. It's about pay it's, equity, right? Yeah, pay equity is about women's rights. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, there, there's that story. We're working on a film on, you know, the, uh, the Great Filter and uh, the Fermi Paradox, you know about that? Uh, that the, the, the Fermi Paradox, is that the? If there's aliens, where are they? And the Great oh, Filter is okay. maybe, 
maybe it's the DNA of life forms in the universe that they burn out of their resources before they have a chance to be able to communicate or travel great distances. Interesting. Yeah, and then um, we're doing a film on plastic pollution solutions. That's come a long ways. Oh, That's a great a one. Whole podcast on that. Yeah, I saw wow. that. That was great. Yeah. And is that all of these are in different stages of production and development? Yeah, I'd say, well, uh, we're done filming the Food 2.0. Uh, the, uh, we're about, I'd say, half done with the plastics film. I have a co-director of people and you're like, how can you do all this? It's like, cause I have a lot of great people that I, I work with. Um, the she changed, so I'm just an executive producer, mm -hmm. you know, helping put the team together and raise the money. Um, I'm doing a book project on, uh, still with that camera, you know, that Clark built for us. We mm. just got back from Indonesia. We were there for about two and a half weeks. It, we won't have to go on a big tangent, but boy, it's like, you know, we went to the 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 place on the planet where you can see the most fish on a single dive. You go to the Caribbean, you're lucky to see 30 fish on a dive. You can see 300 down in this place called Raja Ampat, Western Papua New Guinea, owned by um, Indonesia, Irinjaya. And it's like 76% of the world's corals, hard corals are found there and soft corals. Um, it's like one, of, one of the dive guys said when, when God said, let there be fishes, this is where he was standing. <laughs> it's like, it's right. just like the land before time. And it's really hard to get to. And, you know, we dive with rebreathers so we can stay down for like two and a half, three hours mm -hmm. at a time if we need to. Um, it's a big video production, you know, with lights and cameras, but underwater. And then you can kind of wait for these tides to change. So you have this upwelling of plankton and the soft corals bloom and the fish come out and it's really kind of amazing. And with this camera, you can see far more with your eye than you can with when you're actually there. It's just, you come back with these, these, these images and it's just extraordinary beautiful. And part of it is to get a baseline. So, you know, even that, that place is starting to get hit by bleaching mm -hmm. and, and, you know, global warming, you know, with the, just a two degree shift and an increase in temperatures and you lose the world's corals. Yeah. So we're at that cusp and, you know, we want to see a baseline of like, how beautiful was it? Cause, you know, the next generation might not know what they lost because, you know, we're losing it. And I want to go to, I want to create a big book, like a sumo sized book on, you know, using this extraordinary camera to see something that people haven't seen before. Wow. And yeah, we have a couple of projects going on, you know, but uh, it's like, I just love doing what we're doing. Cause it's like, I mean, I, I kind of wish we, I would have been doing this when I was 20s, in my 20s, but then somebody said, well, you probably would have made shitty movies when you were in your 20s. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know about that. I mean, I think uh, it's cool that, I mean, how old were you when you made The Cove? When you were 50s? 50. Yeah, late bloomer. <laughs> There's hope for all of us out there. Like first movie in your 50s, you win the Oscar. Um, but I also think there's interesting new avenues of creation that are that are becoming available to help tell these stories and impact people. Like I'm, I was thinking of, of Michael Mueller, the photographer turned oh, yeah. filmmaker and what he's doing with VR with sharks and, you know, being able to, you know, give a kid in a village a headset and have him feel like he's underwater swimming with the sharks. Easily you could do that with the coral reefs and any number of these other, you know, kind of endangered areas that give people that that real, you know, strong emotional connection. Yeah, we're, you know, we're working on that. Yeah. We're, we're looking at, uh, you know, new capture techniques. In fact, I'm going up on Saturday to look at some people up at, you know, up in the, where the people think big up in Boston to, uh -huh. to work on a project that we could, you know, to me, it's all about scale. You know, it's that, um, how do you, how do you affect people quick with the, the amount of change that we need. And it, VR seems to be a good way to do it because mm -hmm. it's more immersive, it's more emotional. You maybe you don't yeah. need 30 minutes or an hour and 30 minutes. Maybe you could do it in 20 minutes. One of the problems I have with VR is that it's hard to, you know, it's usually a one-off. It's like, you know, you need a set of goggles. You're not seeing it in a group. There's something that's transformative when you're seeing uh, a movie with other people. Sure, of it, course. Yeah, there is, it's still, it's not quite there yet. I get a little seasick wearing the thing and you know, yeah. it's it's gonna happen at some point. Well, I really love the work that you do. I think that you are, you know, a, a really important voice in this movement for so many reasons. And uh, you know, the movies that you've made have just been incredibly impactful to me personally and to millions of people across the world. And 
I can't wait to see what you create next. And oh, I'd love to have you back when Food 2.0 comes out or the plastic, you know, I could do, I would love to talk to you about the plastic problem. I'm afraid to even ask one question because <laughs> it's it'll be good. two hours. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're uh, I mean, you're I just, I have so much respect for oh, thanks, what you Rich. do. And, and more importantly, like the way that you do it, the intentionality that you bring to your projects and, and just the manner in which you, you comport yourself as a steward of the planet and an activist and uh, you know, a creative voice. So thank you for sharing. Well, today. thanks for the accolades, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, again, I gotta say it's a team effort. You know, it's like everybody involved is like, a, you know, it's a process. It's like, you know, I get too much attention to what we do when it's really a team, but yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so yeah. much. And I love the podcast. It's like, it's my go-to when I, you know, in a car, you know, it, it comes on automatically. As soon as I open the car door, you start, I start hearing your voice. Yeah. All right, <laughs> thanks man, I appreciate that, cheers. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. I truly hope you enjoyed the conversation. To learn more about today's guest, including links and resources related to everything discussed today, visit the episode page at richroll.com where you can find the entire podcast archive, as well as podcast merch, my books, Finding Ultra, Voice of Change and the Plant Power Way, as well as the Plant Power Meal Planner at meals.richroll.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, the easiest and most impactful thing you can do is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and on YouTube, and leave a review and or comment. Supporting the sponsors who support the show is also important and appreciated. And sharing the show or your favorite episode with friends or on social media is, of course, awesome and very helpful. And finally, for podcast updates, special offers on books, the meal planner, and other subjects, please subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find on the footer of any page at richroll.com. Today's show was produced and engineered by Jason Camiolo with additional audio engineering by Kale Curtis. The video edition of the podcast was created by Blake Curtis with assistance by our creative director, Dan Drake. Portraits by Davy Greenberg, Graphic and social media assets, courtesy of Daniel Solis. Thank you, Georgia Whaley, for copywriting and website management. And of course, our theme music was created by Tyler Pyatt, Trapper Pyatt, and Harry Mathis. Appreciate the love, love the support. See you back here soon. Peace. Plants. <laughs>